Onimusha, a game series that stands alongside the likes of Breath of Fire, Dino Crisis, and Beautiful Joe as one of Capcom's many neglected franchises. Born as a literal hybrid of the fixed camera and horror elements of Resident Evil, and the heavy focus on sword-based combat from Devil May Cry, it garnered a cult following as a great horror hack and slash during the PS2 era that only got better with every release. Mostly. With six console releases, a side game on Game Boy Advance, and a... mistake. Onimusha has a large story spanning four decades worth of events. So, here's the full history and lore of Onimusha. Shout out to the Onimusha and Capcom wikis for helping to fill in the gaps that I was otherwise unaware of. Oh, and for transparency's sake, and to keep things as cohesive as possible, anything that is established primarily by the browser game, Onimusha Soul, will not be considered, since that game is full of contradictory character backgrounds. Like suddenly labelling the likes of Motonari Mori, Yoshimoto Imagawa and Nagamasa Asai all as Oni Warriors with no build-up, then randomly labelling Ieyasu Tokugawa and Motochike Chosokabe as Genma. Seriously, look it up. It is a cluster of contradictions. We will also not consider Onimusha tactics either, since not only does it have absolutely no impact on the overall story, but it also appears to have a few narrative inconsistencies, like Magoichi suddenly being a descendant of the Oni White Tiger Spirit despite him attempting to travel to the Oni Sacred Place and gain Oni power in Blade Warriors due to believing he isn't strong enough to fight the Genma without it, or the Oni suddenly being feared by humans as a whole despite their constant actions to defend them. Oh, and obviously pretty much all of the spoilers ahead. Anyway, let's begin. During the initial birth of the Earth, the ensuing chaos also paved the way for the birth of the God of Light known as Fortinbras. He soon created the Genma to thrive as his favoured species, then later created humanity to act primarily as food and slaves to the Genma. The Genma built their hierarchy based on a three-level class system. Low-class Genma had minimal intelligence, obeying orders from higher-class Genma without question and commonly acting as the foot soldiers. Middle-class Genma were more unpredictable, exhibiting behaviour of rabid animals while at least smart enough to speak in somewhat broken sentences. High-class Genma were extremely rare, with an average of one being born per 100,000 Genma. They make up the high command of the Genma, standing below only Fortinbras and are extremely intelligent. Among all Genma, however, were three that became Fortinbras' most trusted servants, known collectively as the Genma Triumvirate. Rosencrantz, also known as the Scientist, was known to hold an intellect so great that it was without peer, and was promoted to become a member of the Triumvirate as a result. Though it's known that the stress of endlessly experimenting on Genma and humans drove him to insanity. Despite this, he was still able to please Fortinbras with the result of his work, and thanks to intelligent minds such as Rosencrantz, the Genma became a highly technologically advanced species. Ophelia, the priestess, was the most feared of the three triumvirate Genma, possessing witch-like powers surpassing her two colleagues, able to shapeshift herself at will and control the minds of anyone she chose by having them wear a special mask. Claudius, the chancellor and leader of the triumvirate, was a master tactician general, expertly leading Genma forces into battle. He was charged by Fortinbras to bring law and order to the Genma, and may have also been an architect as well. After approximately a millennium had passed, a race of beings that had existed since primordial times, known as the Oni, challenged the Genma's rule, particularly in defence of humanity, leading to a war that's believed to have lasted another millennium. Atop these beings, in a similar fashion to Fortinbras, stood the unnamed Oni God of Darkness, the most powerful Oni in existence. Throughout history, the Oni and Genma gained a number of human allies to further their respective aims, 
both granting magic power to humans that earn their favour, with notable examples being the likes of Sogen Osho, his ally Murakoto, and Samanosuke Akechi as only allies, while Genghis Khan, Alexander the Great and Nobunaga Oda are known allies to the Genma. The Oni, in a similar fashion to the Genma, also possessed highly advanced technology far ahead of humanity's capabilities, and were known to create powerful weapons capable of harnessing Oni magic. These weapons were often gifted to their human allies that were known to be powerful enemies of the Genma in the form of divine dragon orbs. Somewhere in the ocean was a place where many Oni resided, known as the Oni Sacred Place. This large castle-like structure was hidden on an island that was surrounded by a thick fog, making it near impossible to locate. The Oni were known to have a strong alliance with the Yagyu clan long before the exploits of Munatoshi Yagyu in Samurai's Destiny. Within this structure, the Oni managed to create a massive flying battleship known as the Oni Genbu, which proved to be capable of devastating destruction. Acknowledging the risk of the Genma utilising this vehicle, the Oni sealed it within the depths of the Sacred Place, only to be revealed by one of the five Sacred Oni Orbs, artefacts that were created by the Oni to protect humanity, and only by an individual with Oni blood or power. To further safeguard the Genbu, the Oni stored the battleship's power core within a separate Oni temple that rested within the deep ocean just in case the sacred place was found and taken over by the Genma. Throughout the war, the Oni created and maintained a pocket dimension known as the Dark Realm, that initially served as a prison for defeated Genma, which was soon converted into a training ground for Oni warriors against the Genma prisoners. Once this training ground had been established, the Oni came into contact with the Mino clan, which consisted of small, human-like creatures wrapped in cocoons. Learning of their ability to teleport others from place to place, the Oni assigned the Mino clan to act as gatekeepers of this realm, each assigning one member of the clan to aid an Oni warrior by granting them access, offering extremely powerful Oni weapons to those who successfully reach the lowest depths and survive. These weapons were far and away stronger than standard Oni weaponry, and were granted only to the strongest of warriors. These weapons included the Bishaman Sword, the Wrecker Ken, and the Ultimate Whip, with the Bishaman Sword, the first of the Oni's ultimate weapons, being labelled as the most powerful of them all. The Mino clan were highly honoured by this arrangement, and hailed members of their clan that aided Oni warriors as heroes. At one point, the Oni constructed a mansion in Lake Biwa, taking the form of a human home in order to remain camouflaged to the Genma. This was developed to hide certain sources of Oni magic from the Genma, and traps were devised inside to keep intruders out, only allowing Oni warriors to pass through. The Genma, however, gained their fair share of powerful warriors also, with one notable example being Gugan Dantis. This warrior quickly became known and feared by the Oni for his unparalleled swordsmanship, and eventually gained the title the greatest swordsman of all demons. During this war, fearing the connection between the Oni and the Yagyus, the Genma successfully located the Oni sacred place, and Gugendontis took only three soldiers with him to assault it, and despite his low numbers, successfully killed every Oni that resided there with ease. It was learnt too late by the Oni that Gugendontis also possessed a magic barrier that shielded him from all forms of harm. So the Oni created an artefact called the Sacred Flute, which when played, would dispel his barrier and make him more vulnerable. However, the Oni were massacred before they were able to use it, and once Gugendontis completed his assault, the Genma took full control of the sacred place and gave the flute to an Uwasha for safekeeping. However, before they were defeated, the Oni predicted that 100 years from then, an Oni warrior would arrive at the sacred place. 
Gugendontis also managed to get his hands on the Oni Orb of Respect, but due to his lack of Oni blood or power, he proved incapable of revealing the Oni Genbu. However, much to the Oni's dismay, the Undersea Oni Temple was also found and assaulted by the Genma, and like the Sacred Place, it also fell under Genma control, allowing them to find and secure the Genbu's power core. Luckily, the Genma failed to find another way to awaken the Oni Genbu, so they could not utilise the battleship against the Oni. At some point, the Genma were also able to convince an unnamed Oni warrior to defect to their side. This warrior was eventually fully converted into a Genma, and came to be known as Garganto. This warrior was a master swordsman on par with Gugendontis, with whom he shared a great mutual respect for, and after swearing total allegiance to Fortinbras, he became the Genma Lord's right-hand man. Around 100 plus years prior to Onimusha Warlords, two Oni warriors began to gain the attention of both sides. Sogan Osho and his longtime ally Murakoto were acknowledged as dangerous enemies by the Genma, with Murakoto in particular striking fear in the hearts of Genma that fought him after his valour had earned him the Divine Dragon Orb Arashi. This enabled him to wield the Oni Naginata Shippu. Fort and Brass and his trusted minion, the Genma scientist known as Gildenstern, deemed him a major threat to the Demon Clan, and eventually hatched a plan to defeat him. Gildenstern sent a challenge to Murakoto to face him in the Cave of Treachery, which the Oni warrior accepted, believing this to be a chance to deprive the Genma of one of their most cunning minds. However, when he and Sogan arrived to the agreed duel, with Sogan's apprentice Saimyu following, Gildenstern sprung a trap which resulted in the deaths of many of their allies. Deeply angered, Murakoto's gauntlet resonated with his flaring emotions and transformed him into an Onimusha, causing him to fly into an uncontrollable rage and attack everything near him, mortally wounding Sogan in the process. Sogan ordered Saimyu to take his wounded body to the cave's entrance, and used his final moments performing a ceremonial rite in order to seal it, offering himself as a human sacrifice to complete the seal, trapping the now out of control Murakoto inside. Sogan then gave a scroll and jewel to Saimyu, ordering him to flee the cave. It is unknown exactly how, but Murakoto ended up perishing within the Cave of Treachery. Gildenstern retrieved his corpse and began to experiment on it, eventually resulting in converting Murakoto into a Genma and resurrecting him as a mindless servant of Fortinbras. This newly resurrected warrior was given the name Marcellus, and was considered one of the greatest assets of the Genma, as well as Gildenstern's pride and joy. This also meant that the Divine Dragon Orb Arashi had now fallen into Genma hands. Humiliated that he was unable to save his master, Saimyu journeyed across the land, eventually suffering from hunger and following the scent of blood into a nearby cave. Surviving on water leaking from the walls, he begins writing and illustrating different scenes over time, including multiple Genma eating human victims alive and the birth of a Genma baby by mixing human blood with evil essence. He eventually suffers heavy wounds and slowly begins to bleed out, but not before not only witnessing the opening of the gate to the demon world, but also illustrating the method of using the Oni's great bow and arrow to open the gate to any other warrior who may find his journal. Saimyu presumably dies from his wounds shortly after this final entry. Eventually, the Oni God of Darkness was somehow destroyed by the Genma, but even with this loss, the Oni were still able to destroy the infamous Genma Triumvirate and somehow seal Fortinbras' godly power and form within a celestial body called the Omen Star, forcing him to permanently take on his serpent-like appearance. Despite this, he was still the most powerful of the Genma, but 
This victory was enough for the Oni to convince the Genma to agree to a truce. The Genma would allow humanity to flourish and thrive, finding their own destinies rather than existing purely as sustenance and labour for them. However, the Genma were also permitted to share with humanity their science and technology in return for regular human sacrifices. What was also likely a mutually agreed term of the truce was the sealing of particularly powerful Oni weapons. The ultimate whip was returned to the very bottom of its own section of the Dark Realm, while the Wrecker Ken was stored in the Phantom Realm, a similar pocket dimension created by Genma scientists that can only be accessed using a Phantom Wedge. However, the Bisherman Sword, named after the God of War, was known for its power to kill not only Genma, but Oni alike. After the Oni Genma War, the Genma sealed the sword itself within the demon world, a realm that they alone governed, with the only entrance to its chamber being accessible through the use of the Bisherman Ocarina. This Ocarina was then sealed within the lowest level of the Dark Realm. The war had also taken its toll on the Oni, with the twelve Oni gods that led the clan being reduced to merely spiritual forms, able to still grant warriors their power, but unable to directly intervene in events. The rest of the Oni's numbers were heavily depleted and scattered, leaving the Oni dangerously weakened in the war's aftermath. The Oni mansion in Lake Biwa was soon used as a resting place for another Oni artifact known as the Oni Army Orb, within which a legion of Oni troops were sealed. If utilised by an Oni warrior, said warrior would be able to release and control the army inside, devastating whatever enemies are seen before them. This ceasefire between the Oni, the Genma and humanity came to an end, however, once humanity managed to become autonomous thanks to the Genma's indirect actions. Humanity had made technological advancements of their own, and after gaining full autonomy from the Genma, began to fight them. With the ceasefire ended, the Genma fought back and resumed their attempts to control humanity, with the Oni resuming their fight against them. Due to both sides' reduced numbers, however, a second all-out war was no longer possible. So, the Genma relied on kidnapping victims and seducing human warriors to join them with offers of power, while the Oni resorted to recruiting human warriors to push back against the Genma. This leads us directly into the events of Oni Musha Warlords. In the early to mid 1500s, a warrior named Hidemitsu Semenosuke Akechi served the Saito clan of Mino province. However, when Yoshitatsu Saito and his father, Dosen Saito, began a power struggle for leadership of the clan, Semenosuke officially separated from the clan and, in 1556, was pressured by his uncle, Mitsuhide Akechi to travel abroad from Japan to learn about other people and cultures to broaden his perspective of the world. This proved to be effective, as he slowly began to see how small and pointless the constant wars over small portions of Japan truly were, and began desiring a world where such conflicts no longer occurred. In the early days of his foreign journey, however, Samanosuke is met with an assassin from the Iga Ninja Clan, a female ninja named Kaide, who was tasked for unknown reasons with assassinating Samanosuke. Her attempts ended in failure, but over time, Kaide came to learn more about Samanosuke. Eventually, his righteous heart caused her to abandon her task of assassination, and chose instead to accompany him as his loyal companion for the four years that he spent abroad, leaving the Egan Ninja Clan behind. Over time, their relationship developed from allies, to friends, and eventually, to lovers. While Samanosuke was abroad, his cousin, the Princess Yuki, found a young boy named Yumimaru, who hailed from the village of Arako. Learning that he was an orphan after his father parents were killed during a battle, Yuki adopted Yumimaru as her younger brother, treating him as if he were her own blood. In early 1560, Samanosuke returned to Japan with Kaede, but refused to rejoin the Saito clan, 
instead deciding to choose for himself where his life would lead. At the same time, infamous warlord and leader of the Oda clan, Nobunaga Oda, is able to mount a surprise attack on Yoshimoto Imagawa in Okehazama, a battle that Samanosuke spectates from a nearby clifftop. This battle ends with Oda's army successfully taking the head of Yoshimoto, spelling victory for Nobunaga. However, while he was reveling in his success, he is struck by an arrow that pierces his throat, ending the warlord's life. After the battle's end, the Genma, impressed by Nobunaga's strength and ambition, recovered his corpse, and Guildenstern successfully resurrected him, believing him to be a powerful servant of the Genma. Guildenstern was proven correct as Nobunaga, learning of his resurrection by the Genma, pledged his loyalty to them in exchange for great power. As a result, the Genma began preparations for the Dark Ceremony, which, once completed, would cement Nobunaga's eternal servitude to the Genma. This ceremony would require the kidnapping of a beautiful human female with a noble heart, who would be sacrificed. Her skull would then be removed and hollowed to act as a grail, which would then be filled with her blood. This grail would then receive a dark blessing from Fortinbras, at which point the human who has made the pact with the Genma would drink the blood, gaining the evil power that was promised and solidifying their eternal servitude. The completion of this ceremony would also end the lives of every living creature, including humans, in the immediate area from which the sacrifice was kidnapped. Upon releasing evil energy throughout the Inabayama castle, Princess Yuki is chosen as the sacrifice for Nobunaga. Over time, she notices that her maids and servants have begun to go missing one by one, and fears monsters to be the cause. After confiding in her brother, only to be dismissed, she sends a letter to Samanosuke asking him to find and save her, fearing that she will be the next to be kidnapped. Samanosuke receives this letter and races to the castle, but when he arrives, he is just seconds too late as a pair of three eyes infiltrates the castle and kidnaps Princess Yuki. Samanosuke, now caught up by Kaede, vows to rescue her and reports her kidnapping to the castle guard. The guard, suspecting that Yuki is in the castle's keep, directs the two to either the western path or northern passage as separate ways to reach it. Samanosuke tells Kaede to go west while he headed north. Soon after he begins his trek, he is interrupted by the two Three Eyes that found Yuki, with her still in tow and unconscious. While unable to kill them, Samanosuke is able to fight them off and goes to Yuki who regains consciousness. The reunion is cut short, however, by the arrival of a hulking Genma called Osric, who taunts Samanosuke. Samanosuke tries to fight, but is effortlessly smashed into a wall, allowing Osric to take Yuki. Samanosuke tries to pursue, but loses consciousness from the blow. While unconscious, he is contacted by the Twelve Oni Gods, now still in spirit form, who warn him that he cannot defeat the Genma as he is, granting him an Oni Gauntlet and making him an Oni Warrior. Samanosuke wakes up to find that the Gauntlet is real and vows to use it to destroy the Genma. He saves a small group of guards from an attack by zombie warriors who direct him to a forest road shortcut towards the keep. He once again encounters the pair of three eyes, this time successfully killing them, and is forced to drop down a hole in a cave opened by Osric. He finds a scroll written by Sogen and a shrine housing the divine dragon orb of thunder, Shiden, allowing him to wield the only weapon, Reizen. Samanosuke reaches the keep to find it surrounded by Genma, and after saving one of the soldiers, climbs down through a hole in the west wall. Venturing inside the cave below, Samanosuke encounters Osric, and after he taunts the warrior, the two begin battling. This time, Samanosuke proves too much for Osric and slays the hulking creature. As Osric falls, the weight of his body breaks a hole in the wall revealing another chamber. Inside, Samanosuke meets Guildenstern, who views Samanosuke with disinterest, 
He tells Samonosuke of Nobunaga's resurrection and, packed with the Genma, then sends his worm-like Genma creation, Reynaldo, to kill him. Reynaldo's ability to regrow itself when bisected proves troublesome, but Samonosuke manages to kill it and recovers the divine dragon orb of fire, Kuen, granting him the only weapon, Enryu. With this new weapon, he breaks the seal on the keep's entrance and gets inside to find it in ruins. Inside the keep, he encounters a samurai attempting to kidnap a young boy, and demands to know why. In the confusion, the boy bites his kidnapper's hand, giving him the chance to escape, while Samonosuke prevents the man's pursuit. The man initially suspects him to be a member of the Saito clan, but quickly recognises him as Samonosuke Akechi. He reveals himself as a servant of the older clan named Tokichiro Kinoshita, and asks Samonosuke if he'd join him, but Samonosuke flatly refuses. Tokichiro is amused by this and leaves, telling Samonosuke that he isn't giving up just yet. Further into the keep, he encounters Kaede chasing the young boy and intercepts. The boy is untrusting, but at least reveals himself as Yumimaru. He says he doesn't know why Tokichiro was after him, and when asked why he's here, he flees past Kaede, with her giving chase at Samonosuke's request. Later, when Samonosuke reaches the upper levels of the keep after saving two more soldiers, Kaede catches up to him, telling him that Yumimaru was the son of a farmer that was killed in war, and that Yuki took him in. Samonosuke assumes that Yumimaru is here to save Yuki and questions why Tokichiro is chasing him. Before they can find an answer, a trap is sprung and they are forced to make their way through multiple booby-trapped rooms. After getting past three chambers, the next houses a trap that when triggered seals Samonosuke in a metal room and separating him from Kaede. Water then begins to fill the room, threatening to drown him. Luckily, Kaede is able to solve a nearby puzzle to disable the trap and free Samonosuke. The two find a pull tab in the next room that disables the traps and reveals a staircase, and Kaede decides to search the castle for further clues. Venturing further into the upper floors, Samonosuke finds a Three Eyes kidnapping Yumemaru, but when he tries to chase them he is intercepted once again by Tokichiro, who asks again to join the Oda clan, but Samonosuke is too focused on Yumemaru. Tokichiro reveals the Oda clan's alliance with the Genma, angering Samonosuke at their willingness to let innocent people die, but Tokichiro argues that it's just the strong preying on the weak. Samonosuke takes a swing at Tokichiro after he is told that Yuki will be sacrificed for the Dark Ceremony, but Tokichiro flees, taunting the warrior. Samonosuke finds a room with a green Genma seal that houses Yumemaru, but he is unable to open it. Reaching the roof, Samonosuke is confronted by Marcellus, and after a difficult battle, Marcellus falls, finally relinquishing the divine orb Arashi from Genma hands. With Arashi and the only weapon Shippu now in his hands, he breaks the Genma seal and saves Yumemaru, taking him to a safe room in the keep with Kaede. Samonosuke promises to save Princess Yuki and tells him of his overseas travel, asking him to help people understand how pointless the constant wars for small portions of land are. This conversation is interrupted by the appearance of a servant of Princess Hatsu named Nui, who tells them that Princess Yuki is being held underground before fainting. Samonosuke leads Kaede to guard the two, and finds his way to an underground sanctum created by the Genma. After using a purifying bell to calm some tortured souls, he eventually reaches a room with a strange structure, only to be greeted once again by Tokichiro. He asks again for Samonosuke to join the Oda clan, but is angrily refused. In response, he calls to the Genma that it's time to begin the Dark Ceremony, causing the structure to gather magic and strike Samonosuke, incapacitating him. Tokichiro laughs as a magic wall traps Samonosuke, revealing that Kaede is likely in danger as well. While this is happening, a Samonosuke doppelganger appears before Kaede, but when she asks if he found anything, Nui grabs Yumemaru, revealing herself as a Genma ally. But before Kaede can intervene, the doppelganger punches her in the stomach, leaving her unconscious. 
Tokichiro leaves Samanosuke as he is sucked into the ground, taunting his lack of experience. Kaede reawakens to find Yumemaru gone and leaves to find them, receiving a key from a dying soldier who directs her to the Western Prison. Using it to access the west side of the castle, Kaede navigates multiple puzzles to find the necessary key slates to open the prison, where she finds an only weapon called the Sacred Knife. Now able to cut down Genma eggs that blocked the underground prison cell, she enters to find Princess Yuki, though she doesn't realise this initially. Kaede attempts to pick the lock, and Yuki recognises her, referencing one of Samonosuke's letters while he was abroad, which causes Kaede to realise just who it is she's saving. Kaede promises to save her, but before she can finish picking the lock, Yuki is grabbed by Guildenstern, who disappears with her into the darkness leaving Kaede to be ambushed by a powerful Genma that can render itself invisible and hide underground. Despite this advantage, Kaede slays it, and escapes to tell Samonosuke what just happened. Meanwhile, Samonosuke awakes in an underground cave and makes his way through, only to be confronted by his doppelganger, a Genma named Stilado. While it was able to mimic Samonosuke's fighting style, he still manages to slay it and escape the cave via a ladder. Finding the evil plate, he uses it to open a door in the keep to find Nui with an unconscious Yumimaru. She decides to reveal her true form and transforms into the Genma known as Hakuba, summoning a gate to the demon world, taking Yumimaru inside and closing the gate behind her. Before Samonosuke can give chase, a stone appears in front of the gate and erects a magic barrier to prevent anyone from entering. Kaede appears and attempts to destroy it, only for her kunai to be ineffective, and they agree to separate to find a solution. Samonosuke finds a soldier outside the keep being attacked by insects like Genma and quickly dispatches them. He then searches the western area and finds an Uwasha and two Barabazus guarding a decorated sword. After defeating them, he uses this sword to unlock the way to the eastern area of the castle. Samonosuke navigates the area until he takes a boat to a storehouse in the middle of the lake, within which he finds the Great Bow. This, however, causes the gate behind him to lock and trap him inside, and he soon finds himself surrounded by more insect Genma. Kaede arrives at the eastern lake and is ambushed by insect Genma, Fighting her way through, she reaches a locked off area where she is eventually able to find the Oni's Great Arrow. Using a decorated arrow to swap it with, she finds another boat to the storehouse and finds Samanosuke locked inside. Noticing Hakuba, she warns him of the Genma's arrival before noticing a large amount of gunpowder nearby. Inside, the Genma back away from Samonosuke as Hakuba arrives, telling him that Yumamaru would be sacrificed in front of Yuki in order to make her blood more delicious with sorrow for when Nobunaga drinks it, angering Samonosuke. She orders the other Genma to kill him and they begin their battle, but Samonosuke proves too much for them and Hakuba is defeated. During the fight, Kaede spreads gunpowder around the building and ignites it as Hakuba is beaten warning Samonosuke to escape. Hikuba, not yet killed, gets back up, but is soon pinned by burning debris as she tries to chase Samonosuke, slowly burning her to death before the building explodes. Samonosuke and Kaede barely escape the explosion and are washed up on shore nearby, but as Samonosuke wakes up, Kaede remains unconscious, so he takes her back to the safe room and has her rest there. At some point before Samonosuke decides to enter the demon realm, he encounters a member of the Mino clan, Mino Goro, who offers to take him to the Dark Realm, telling him that he would receive powerful weapons. Samonosuke agrees to be taken there, and after successfully reaching the lowest depths, finds the Bisherman Ocarina. After returning, he reaches the Dark Gate and uses the Great Bow and Arrow to destroy the stone allowing him access to the demon world, where he is then met with Guildenstern. Samonosuke mocks him, saying he has no time for the scientist, and an angry Guildenstern summons a now overhauled Marcellus, stronger than ever before, to face the Oni warrior, and leaves them to fight. Samonosuke is able to break Marcellus's shield, 
and the Genma draws a second sword in response, trading defense for speed. But even this is not enough, and Marcellus falls once again. With the way cleared, Samonoski moves further into the demon world, finding a strange door that responds to the Bishop and Ocarina. He plays it, opening the door, and finds and unseals the infamous Bisherman Sword. With it, he effortlessly cleaves through the remaining Genma until he reaches the ceremonial chamber. Inside, he finds Yuki and Yumamaru bound above him, but before he is able to free them, the Genma Lord Fortinbras appears and beckons Nobunaga to approach and complete the ceremony. He summons lightning and shocks Yuki, preparing her as a sacrifice and Samonosuke challenges the unholy king. Despite Fortinbras' massive size, strength and magic, Samonosuke successfully defeats the king after a long battle. Not long after Fortinbras falls, a now healed Kaede appears and helps Samonosuke free the two prisoners, and they all attempt to flee the now crumbling structure around them, a result of the destructive conflict with Fortinbras. As they escape, however, Fortinbras wakes up and grips Samonosuke, who demands the others escape, leaving him trapped with the Genma King. As Fortinbras squeezes the life out of him, the blood dripping from his mouth hits his gauntlet, which triggers an explosion of Oni magic that shreds the hand of Fortinbras and transforms Samonosuke into a true Onimusha. Angry, Fortinbras lunges at him but Samonosuke effortlessly splits his remaining arm in half before driving his sword into the Genma's third eye, finally ending the Genma Lord's life. Now human again, Samonosuke slowly comes to to find Nobunaga looking over him in silence, and the two manage to escape the demon world before it fully collapses, though what potential confrontation they had is not known. With Fortinbras dead, the remaining Genma slowly skulk back into hiding, now unsure what to do with their king dead. Fortinbras' death also meant that Nobunaga's pact was never completed, so his eternal servitude to them was never cemented. And with the clear power vacuum within the Genma, he took the opportunity to unite them under his own rule. His already respected ambition and strength allowed him to eventually rise to power as the new Genma Lord. The year after Fortinbras' demise, the leader of the Saito clan, Yoshitatsu Saito, died, leaving the infamously feeble-minded Tatsuoki to succeed his father. With a less effective leader at the helm of the Saito clan, Nobunaga took the opportunity to launch a siege of the Inabayama castle in 1567, burning the castle and killing Tatsuoki. This spelled the end of the Saito family's history and Nobunaga renamed the castle Gifu Castle. Whether or not the Genma were involved in this siege is not known. Princess Yuki and Yumemaru successfully escaped the siege and began staying in Sakai with a family friend, Baron Sokyu Imai. Less than a month later, with Sokyu's blessing, she departed with Yumemaru on a ship to travel abroad in a similar fashion to Samonosuke. Kaede, however, spent the next 10 years searching for Samonosuke after the events of Warlords. In 1568, she came under the employment of his uncle, Mitsuhide, as an agent. Samonosuke, in reality, went into hiding after escaping the demon world, fearing the power of the Onimusha that he had accidentally unleashed against Fortinbras, and believing that if he tapped into it again, it would risk harming those close to him, particularly Kaede, who he knew would refuse to leave his side regardless. Unfortunately, after the death of Fortinbras, Minogoro is hunted down and killed by the Genma as punishment for his role in Samonosuke's successful defeat of the Genma King. Regardless, the Bisherman Sword was at some point returned to the depths of the Dark Realm, likely due to its reputation for killing both Genma and Oni, something that Samonosuke further feared with his yet-to-be-controlled Onimusha power. In 1571, Nobunaga sent a legion of soldiers to Mount Hiei from Mount Hachioji, setting fire to the temple which spread across a large section of the mountain. Everyone inside was slain by Oda's forces, with the exception of a monk named Dokan, who managed to escape the blaze to the mountains. 
After the fighting died down, Dokkan cautiously returned to witness the aftermath. Horrified, he hid in a nearby cave, but claims to have heard the screams of the dead, deeming it punishment for his attempts to flee. He then gathered the bones of the dead, spoke a number of mantras, and began working on a large stone statue to honour the memory of those slaughtered. Unfortunately, from that day onwards, Mount Hiei became an extremely common area for Genma to be found. This leads us right into the events of Onimusha 2 Samurai's Destiny. Now, before we begin, there's a slight bit of confusion surrounding exactly when Onimusha 2 and Onimusha Blade Warriors takes place. The general consensus is that they both occur in 1570, but I can say with confidence that that is not true at all for two reasons. The first reason being Odani Castle and Nagamasa Asai. Historically, Nobunaga actually sought an alliance with Asai for the sake of peace by arranging for him to be married to his sister Oichi in 1564, which Nagamasa accepted. Fun fact, Nobunaga was so happy with this wedding that he actually fronted the entire bill, which was not common. Typically the cost of ceremonies like this was split between both parties, but Nobunaga decided to pay for it in full. Unfortunately, this alliance ended when Nagamasa betrayed Nobunaga by siding with the Asakura family in 1570, which led to a three-year conflict between them, ending with the 1573 Siege of Odani Castle. It was during this siege that Nagamasa, well aware that victory was impossible, committed seppuku. Fun fact number two, before Nobunaga initiated this attack, he sent Nagamasa a request to evacuate Oichi and her daughters first, which Nagamasa accepted. Once he knew that his sister and nieces were safely away, only then did he launch the attack. Now, with yet another history lesson in mind, this siege is most likely the same attack that occurs at the end of the game, though this attack of course fails, only to be repeated in Blade Warriors when the castle finally falls. This is further confirmed by a document that shows planned Genma hunts, with the attack on Odani Castle marked for 1573. If that isn't enough, reason number two is Juju Dorma's diary, which is a document found just outside of her boss encounter, and it shows an entry written on January 10th, 1573. This, without any doubt, confirms that Onimusha 2 takes place in 1573, with Blade Warriors occurring not long after in the same year, which also lines up with Onimusha 3's opening cutscene that asserts that nine years have passed since Nobunaga's defeat at the hands of Jubei, with Demon Siege taking place in 1582. Now then, back to it. 13 years after the events of Warlords, Nobunaga's strength had been fully restored, and now in full command of the Genma, decided to resume his campaign to conquer the country. With Semenosuke still missing, Nobunaga recognised the Yagyu clan as the greatest threat to his rule due to their close connection to the Oni, so he launched a surprise attack on the village. Some villagers fought back, but with the attack force being made up of purely Genma soldiers, their efforts were in vain, and the village along with the entire population was reduced to nothing in a single day. With the Yagyu village destroyed, Nobunaga set his sights on Odani Castle and Saiga village as the next threat to be stamped out. Within Odani Castle resided the Lord Nagamasa Asai and his second wife Oichi, the sister to Nobunaga. At some point Oichi learned that Nagamasa had three daughters from his past wife, and feeling betrayed initially planned to leave. However, she soon learned of the impending attack on Odani Castle by her brother and decided to set out to stop him, taking on the name Oyu in order to hide her identity. In Saiga Village, the leader of the Kishu Saiga gun team, Magoichi Saiga, learns that Nobunaga is also planning an attack on Saiga Village. Already aware of the destruction of the Yagyu and believing that the same would occur here, 
he sets out to find a way to deplete Nobunaga of funds and supplies in order to hinder his attempts at conquest. At some point he comes into contact with the famous Hozuin monk Eke and Kokuji, and the two develop a clear disdain for each other. Another notable figure, Kotaro Fuma, the young chief of the Hojo clan's Fuma ninjas, also learns of Nobunaga's destructive conquest and sets out to foil his forces. While Nobunaga is resuming his conquest of Japan, he commissions Guildenstern to create what he dubbed the Golden Evil Statue, which would require roughly 6,000 tons of gold. When seeing the design specifications, the scientist was initially confused, unable to figure out why the Warlord wanted it. He quickly changes his tune, however, once he starts seeing the statue itself as it neared completion, believing it to shine with dignity and command the worship of any who witness it. It is at this time that he admits to enjoying his work far more under Nobunaga, recognising that Nobunaga's methods of ruling humanity through inciting worship, rather than Fortinbras' efforts of ruling by force, has proved to be far more effective, and acknowledging that ceremonies and sacrifices have increased in frequency under Nobunaga's rule. Jubei Yagyu, the chief of the Yagyu clan, hears of the attack of Yagyu village while away somewhere else and begins racing home, fearing the worst. Upon returning, he finds the village devoid of life and all of its citizens dead. Boiling with rage, he overhears a strange voice beckoning him to follow it. He is soon met with a heavily injured villager, Yasuke, who asks him to flee, but is killed before he can reveal who is responsible by leftover soldiers. Jubei demands to know who they work for, but their silence is met with Jubei's anger, and he slays them. Continuing to follow the voice past Morgenma, a cave opens across the lake, leading Jubei to a hidden spring. The voice finally takes the form of a woman with a serpent-like tail, and Jubei prepares to attack, assuming her to be a demon and to be responsible for his clan's massacre. She initially incapacitates him, however, and tells him that Nobunaga ordered the attack, and reveals that his hand has the innate ability to absorb Genma souls. Jubei looks at his hand and an Oni mark appears, confirming her statement. She then gives Jubei the Charity Orb, one of five sacred Oni orbs that were created to protect humanity from the Genma, telling him that he needs all five to defeat Nobunaga. Then tells him to head to the village of Imasho after receiving power from the Yagyu's Dragon Shrine. Jubei questions her identity, and she reveals herself to be his mother, Takajo, and that she is in fact an Oni, meaning he has the blood of an Oni. As a result, he does not need a gauntlet like other Oni warriors, and receives the Oni weapon, Baraito, from the shrine without the need for a dragon orb. Jubei arrives in the town of Imasho, which became a mining town in 1568, after gold was discovered in a nearby mine. As he passes a crowd of people picking gold from the corpse of a recently deceased miner, he sees a female warrior being harassed by three men, but notices one of the Oni orbs around her neck as she leaves. Jubei tries to approach, but is forced to deal with the belligerent drunks first as she leaves, wounding one of them after warning them to stop, and scaring the other two off. Jubei finds the gold mine closed to those without a permit, so he returns to town to find Magoichi in the tavern. A spear soon flies across the room, thrown by an angry Eke, questioning where a girl he was seeing had gone. Magoichi reveals that she gave him the help sign, so he had to intervene. Insulting Eke's desirability, Eke demands a fight outside the tavern, and Magoichi begrudgingly follows. After a brief scuffle, Jubei steps in and mediates, recognising them both as well-known honourable men fighting dishonourably over trifle things. Magoichi identifies him as the chief of the Yagyu, and Eke heartily calls it fate that the three of them met, calling off the fight with a hearty laugh as they both re-enter the tavern. Now, before we continue, things get a little complicated here since Onimusha 2 features multiple different scenarios that can occur depending on the friendship level of your four allies. This obviously means that some scenarios overlap with others, 
and as a result, some are considered non-canon. To try and keep this simple, scenarios that have no effect on the story and no real character development will be skipped, like Eke's weakness and prospecting for potassium nitrate. Whereas conflicting scenes that both affect the story or hold genuine character development will be decided on which makes more sense, like having Eke help Jubei in the mine instead of Magoichi or Kataro. This obviously means that the likes of Kataro's high friendship ending, which involves him dying, is non-canon, while Eke's high friendship ending, which has him make contact with Motonari Mori, is canon. Now then, back to it. Jubei acquires a permit and is granted access into the mine, but he is quickly approached by two fleeing miners screaming that monsters are in the mine and that a woman wearing armour entered despite their warnings. Jubei assumes it to be the same woman from earlier and enters as well. He is soon met by a group of Jade, which he fights through. A little deeper into the mine, he is ambushed by Morgenma, but Eke appears to help fight them off, asking Magoichi to do the same, but the gunman refuses, not being in the mood. After defeating them, they are approached by a man asking to help rescue his daughter from the Genma, and Eke, assuming the daughter to be a young, beautiful woman, heartily agrees to help. Eke leaves with the father, followed by Magoichi, who assumes he'll get in trouble. After this exchange, Jubei enters a deeper room and finds another Oni Dragon Shrine, which grants him the Oni weapon Hyojin Yaru, a spear that harnesses ice. Jubei then follows the others, only to find them arguing and mediates again, asking why Eke is wasting time. Eke reveals that he dreams of becoming a feudal lord and will do anything to achieve it, including serving Nobunaga, and is angry that Magoichi laughed at his dream, thinking that it's silly. Magoichi asks what Jubei's dream is, and Jubei simply answers that he aims to kill Nobunaga. Magoichi leaves, calling Jubei possessed by a vengeful ghost. Eke following. Jubei proceeds further and is met by a large gangma named Ginkumfats, who demands to know why he's here. When Jubei answers that he has no quarrel, Ginkumfats chastises him for thinking he is the Genma's equal, but Jubei claims he's better. Amused by this, Ginkumfats attacks Jubei, but Jubei confirms his statement and overcomes the creature, though Ginkumfats warns that he will be back. With the way clear, Jubei continues and finds an exhausted miner who tells him that he is the only one still alive after being forced to work as slaves by the Genma. Jubei returns him to town and nurses him back to health, and the grateful miner gives him an object to open the cover of the hole that he was initially lying near, believing that the woman Jubei is looking for may have been taken there. Before leaving Imasho, Jubei finds a young ninja but in a fight or flight response, the ninja launches a kunai and flees. He leads Jubei outside the tavern, recognising his mission to kill Nobunaga and offering to help him, revealing himself as Kotaro Fuma, a name Jubei recognises. He immediately warns Jubei of the woman he is searching for, saying that she may actually be an agent of the Oda clan. Kotaro leaves promising to reveal her true identity in time. Jubei re-enters the mine and finds the covered hole the miner spoke of, and uses the strange object to open the cover, transporting him to an underground cave where he is attacked by two staff-wielding Genma. After slaying them, he exits the cave to find himself in the courtyard of Gifu Castle, now under the control of Nobunaga and sporting a large Genma structure connected to the roof. He is approached by Magoichi, who explains his vengeful ghost comment by revealing that Eke lost his wife and child when the feudal lord he served lost a great battle, yet he still holds on to his dream. He then reminds Jubei that if he kills Nobunaga, another tyrant will replace him in an endless cycle of death and revenge. Jubei enters Gifu Castle and finds Eke on an upper floor fighting Genma. After dispatching them, the two notice a baby after she starts crying from the noise, and the father from earlier runs up confirming this child to be the daughter he was looking for. This distresses Eke, who is briefly taunted by Magoichi, but Eke suddenly grabs the child, retelling the story of when he lost his family in the fires of the castle he served in, 
weeping that he initially wanted to pick up a feudal lord to make his daughter a princess and give her the best possible life. While it isn't confirmed, Eke's familiarity with Gifu Castle, including call it Inabayama on occasion, may suggest that the lord he served was in fact Tatsuoki Saito, before the latter was killed by Nobunaga's assault after warlords. After regaining composure, he returns the child to her father, asking him to take care of her. After everyone leaves, Jubei uses a purified charm to help his spirit reach the afterlife, who in turn helps him unlock the door once sealed by the evil plate. Inside, he finds the woman he was looking for being accosted by Tokichiro, taunting her about her inability to stop Nobunaga from attacking Odani Castle. She responds angrily, and Tokichiro summons Genma to kill her, only for Jubei to intervene, shocking Tokichiro who thought he should have died with the rest of his clan, which further confirms for Jubei that the Oda clan destroyed his village. Tokichiro orders their deaths and flees, and Jubei tells the female warrior to flee as well while he dispatches the Genma. After doing so, he moves past the destroyed demon gate, and comes face to face with Gugan Dantis, who expresses excitement at the prospect of a worthy foe and a battle between the two begins. Unfortunately, his barrier prevents Jubei from landing a hit, and Gugan Dantis's incredible skill catches Jubei further off guard. And after being backed into a corner, the female warrior appears with a ladder to help him escape. Disappointed that he's fleeing, Gugendontis realises that Jubei cannot win, and leaves them. Jubei notices, but more Genma appear in an attempt to ambush them, but Kataro appears covering Jubei's escape. He notices the other warrior, however, and becomes suspicious. The two escape into Gifu's west area and find a large metal orb which begins resonating with the Oni Orb around the warrior's neck, confirming it to be one of the five Oni Orbs Jubei is looking for. She allows Jubei to use it, which causes it to transform into a metallic horse, and recognising Jubei as an Oni Warrior allows him to ride it. He beckons his ally to get on as well, and they both ride back to Imasho. After arriving, she tells Jubei that the Trust Orb has been passed down through her family for generations and allows Jubei to keep it. She reveals herself as Oyu of Odani, and that she was trying to sneak into Gifu Castle to kill Nobunaga after his army overwhelmed Odani's. Clearly now fond of him, she tells him that she's staying in Imasho for a while, but awkwardly backs off and leaves. As Jubei is about to follow, he is called by Kataro, who asks who she was. Jubei tells her, but Kataro doubts that Oyu is her real name, warning Jubei not to trust her as he leaves. Jubei returns to the tavern and is told that a woman has been asking for him to meet her in the marketplace. Jubei goes to meet her, but she reveals herself to be a Genma named Juju Dorma, who is seemingly enamoured by Nobunaga. Jubei notices that she has an Oni Orb, and she threatens to kill him and Takajo for defying Nobunaga. She races to Yagyu Village to kill her, and Jubei gives chase. Upon arriving in Yagyu Village, he is intercepted by more Genma, but Oyu appears to fight them off, giving him a chance to catch up with Jujudoma. As she fights off the Genma, she tries to catch up with Jubei, but Kataro watches her from a rooftop, still suspicious of her motives. Unfortunately, Jubei arrives too late, and Takajo is slain by Jujudoma mocking him as she leaves. Takajo dies in Jubei's arms, wishing they had more time to talk. Oyu enters and Jubei tells her that Takajo described her first meeting with his father, falling in love at first sight while he was training, believing it to be destiny. He says that he finds it hard to accept that he is the only blooded child that resulted in the union of a human and an oni just because an otherwise stranger told him that she was his mother, but that if it was true, he would be the oni that would destroy the Genma. Oyu silently leaves, and Jubei soon follows after taking the ring left behind after his mother's body dissipated. He enters the Yagyu household and finds Oyu by the fireplace. She notes that Jubei sees Takajo as his mother, even though she's an Oni, and he responds with his realisation that he never knew his mother before now, so he's happy knowing that she was still watching over him. 
owe your question to someone would still feel like a mother and child if they weren't blood related, which confuses Jubei. But she decides to drop the question and quickly leaves. Using Takajo's ring, Jubei reveals and solves a puzzle to open a hidden underground chamber within which holds more traps that Jubei manages to pass through, leading him to the Fog Valley. Climbing the cliff, Jubei eventually reaches the entrance of a forest where he finds another dragon shrine, granting him the only weapon Senpu Maru, a naginata similar to Shipu. With his new weapon, Jubei enters the forest, but the fog causes Jubei to lose his way, trapping him inside. Meanwhile, Kotaro arrives in the fog valley, tracking Jubei east and suspecting a Genma trap. Kotaro arrives to the foggy forest and finds the exit blocked off by a magic barrier, and using various wedges he finds, manages to enter the phantom realm and finds the two totems necessary to dispel the barrier. With the trap now dealt with, Kotaro enters the forest and leads a grateful Jubei outside, parting ways once at the edge. Before Jubei is about to leave, however, he is ambushed by Juju Dorma, who taunts an angry Jubei before preparing for battle. Before they can fight, a revived Ginkum Fats appears, demanding to be the first to fight Jubei and revealing his immortality. The two Genma bicker over who will face Jubei first, but Juju Dorma concedes saying that she expects Ginkum Fats to lose again regardless as she leaves. Despite his confidence, Ginkum Fats is beaten once again, promising to return later. Exiting the forest, Jubei finds Magoichi and Eke fighting again, this time due to Eke's own suspicions of Magoichi's motives. Magoichi sympathises with Jubei's recent loss of Takajo, but Eke remains suspect, saying that for all they know, Magoichi is an agent of Nobunaga. Magoichi doesn't outright deny this, and when questioned, silently leaves with Eke in pursuit. Using figurines of Nobunaga, Jubei opens the way towards Juju Dorma's lair, finding her admiring herself in the mirror. Jubei angers her by saying that no man would ever want to play with a nasty thing like her, and the two begin to fight. Naturally, Jubei's skill proves too much for Juju Dorma, and in death, she accidentally reveals a mechanism behind her portrait of Nobunaga, and Jubei takes the Oni Honesty Orb from her bladed weapon. Jubei uses the mechanism to open the wall, revealing a cave system, but when he enters, the wall slams shut and the cave fills with toxic gas. Jubei speeds to the end of the cave, which is nothing more than a cliff, and has no choice but to dive off into the ocean, swimming into an opening underwater. Resurfacing inside, he finds an Oni vehicle that is powered by the Honesty Orb, allowing him speedy travel through the ocean water and taking him to the Oni Sacred Place. Soon after arriving, another vehicle approaches the shore ridden by Gugan Dantes. The Genma suggests that Jubei is thrilled to meet someone stronger than him, while Jubei remains annoyed. After introducing himself again, the two fight. Once again, his barrier proves impenetrable, and Jubei is beaten with Gugendontis injuring his arm as he falls. Ou appears, however, and defends Jubei, and although clearly outmatched by the Genma Swordsman, Gugendontis calls off the fight, calling it shameful to be saved by Ou twice. As he leaves, he tells them Nobunaga is about to launch his attack on Odani Castle itself, asking them what they'll do about it. Once he leaves, Ou bandages Jubei's wound and has him stay there while it heals as she explores, reassuring him that she'll be fine. Oyu enters the sacred place and is met with an apparition of Takajo, who thanks her for saving Jubei and tells her about the sacred flute that was handed down from the Oni clan, telling her that it will allow Jubei to compete with Gugan Dantes. Oyu agrees to find it, satisfying Takajo's spirit as it fades. Oyu traverses the sacred place until she finds a chamber hidden by a Gerahon. She enters to find the Uwasha assigned to the sacred place and successfully kills it, retrieving the sacred flute that it guarded. Oyu returns to Jubei to find his wound healing properly and gives him the sacred flute, telling him that Takajo asked her to do so from the afterlife. Oyu leaves and Jubei enters the sacred place finding another dragon shrine, this time receiving the large Oni hammer weapon, Dokotsui, that commands Earth. As he ventures through the structure, 
he is intercepted by Kotaro who says he's discovered Oyu's identity. But before he can tell Jubei, someone enters and Kotaro tells Jubei to hide. Oyu enters looking for Jubei but Kotaro confronts her, accusing her of being an agent of Nobunaga and demanding that she never approach Jubei again, threatening to kill her if she does. Oyu flatly denies this but Kotaro attacks her, forcing her to flee with him in pursuit. Continuing, Jubei eventually runs into Magoichi as he is in the middle of asking an amused Tokichiro where the gold is. Tokichiro, sensing the opportunity to create a rift between them, claims that Magoichi offered his allegiance to Nobunaga in exchange for riches, noting the gunman's supposed deception as he leaves. Jubei asks for confirmation and Magoichi once again doesn't outright deny the claim seemingly confirming and approaching Eke's suspicions, prompting the monk to attack him. But Magoichi simply says that he does what he wants and leaves with Eke pursuing. Jubei proceeds further, powering a lift using the Senpumaru to produce the wind power necessary, and is followed closely by Oyu, who is once again intercepted by Kataro, who plans to kill her. He is attacked by a Genma before he can, however, and Oyu kills it and tries to help him but Kitara refuses and says that nothing has changed. Oyu tells him that she is planning on returning to her three daughters in Odani Castle, choosing them over Jubei. Kitaro doesn't believe her, and Oyu suspects that Kitaro hates her and the woman in general because her mother was killed by the Fuma clan after she abandoned him and ran away while he was a baby, but then questions if that was even true because no mother would abandon their child like that. Kotaro angrily tells her that she knows nothing and leaves, Oyu chasing him. Meanwhile, Jubei finds a portal that teleports him to the eastern area of Gifu Castle, finding himself on a rooftop. He climbs down but finds the door locked, rendering him unable to leave. However, he hears Eke humming to himself outside and catches the monk's attention, asking him to open the door. Eke laughs at the situation and asks Jubei where to find the key, but Jubei tells him that he wouldn't need help if he knew. Laughing again, Eke agrees and leaves telling Jubei that it will cost him. Eke explores the area, eventually finding a boat that leads him to the storehouse that spelt the end for Hekuba, now rebuilt. Once inside, he finds an Uwasha and defeats it, retrieving the snake key from it and after heading back, uses it to unlock the door for Jubei. A thankful Jubei promises to repay Eke with liquor and women, heartily pleasing the monk, and he goes on his way. Now free to leave, Jubei explores the eastern area himself, and finds another portal that leads him to a Genma-infested cave that houses multiple people that appear to be turned to stone. Inside, Magoichi is cursing Nobunaga's evil, horrified at the stone victims. While the gunman is distracted, Jubei enters and notices another gunman taking aim at Magoichi, taking a bullet for him. This ends up turning him to stone as well, and the gunman is revealed to be Tokichiro, who is in fact using petrifaction bullets created by Guildenstern to turn anything hit by it into stone. He attempts to shoot Magoichi again, but Magoichi is able to shoot Tokichiro's weapon, destroying it. Tokichiro flees, satisfied that he at least hit Jubei, and Magoichi vows to free Jubei from his stone prison. Venturing deep into the cave, he eventually finds a great powder tube, which was also created as a precaution in order to reverse the effects of the petrifaction bullet. But it is quickly stolen by a translucent Genma before he can reach Jubei. Magoichi successfully kills it and retrieves the tube, and successfully uses it to return Jubei back to normal. He then gives the grateful Jubei the tube and leaves. With it, Jubei frees the rest of the petrified victims in the cave. After exiting the cave, he finds Magoichi in the middle of battling a group of Batabone before one of them manages to injure him. Jubei dispatches the rest and checks on the gunman who confirms that he's fine. After a moment of hesitation, he admits to Jubei that he is here to stop Nobunaga after learning that the Warlord is also planning to attack Saiga village working towards depleting the Warlord's funds and supplies. He says that the village houses many kind women who all raised him like their own after his mother died, and they didn't deserve to get destroyed in likely the same way as the Yagyus were. Magoichi leaves, wishing to live in a time of peace. 
Eke also learns of all of this sitting on a nearby rooftop, clearly moved by Magoichi's motivations. Jubei finds two more frozen victims in the lake storehouse that were initially blocking one of its rooms and frees them. Inside, he finds a portal that warps him to the blood pond of the sacred place, and after fighting through further Genma, reaches the treasury where he finds the key necessary to dispel a barrier blocking a control room to the west. Entering the room, he finds Tokuchiro attempting to restrain Oyu, knocking him away from her and injuring his back. He quickly hits a button, opening a trap door in the floor below them both. While inside, Oyu eventually reveals herself as Oichi, the sister of Nobunaga and wife of Nagamasa Asai. She admits that she felt betrayed by Nagamasa when discovering his past wife's three daughters, but then left the castle to stop Nobunaga once she discovered his incoming attack. She then began to focus only on Jubei after meeting him, saying that nothing else mattered anymore, calling herself selfish. She admits that her stepdaughters are waiting for her, and before the two can share a kiss, Tokuchiro activates the trap, threatening to kill them both. The trap backfires, however, creating a hole in the wall that allows them to escape. In the next room, an explosion opens a hole in the floor and Oyu almost falls in, but is suddenly saved by Gugan Dantis, who calls it natural for men to save weak women, requesting no thanks. Oyu leaves with Gugan Dantis gleefully expressing anticipation for this fight, and Jubei acknowledges Gugan Dantis' honour for saving Oyu. The two begin their final bout, but Jubei takes the opportunity to play the sacred flute, successfully breaking the Genma's barrier. With no barrier, Jubei finally overcomes Gugendontis' skill and defeats him. Now seeing him as an honourable warrior, Jubei holds the Genma, with Gugendontis praising Jubei's skill and strength. He finally asks Jubei to tell him his name, and Jubei obliges, calling him the greatest swordsman of all demons. Satisfied, Gugendontis gives Jubei the only orb of respect and finally succumbs to his wounds. Jubei reunites with Oyu and uses the respect orb on a nearby mechanism, which causes a massive vessel called the Oni Genbu to reveal itself. The two are then ambushed by Genma, and during the fight, Tokuchiro takes advantage and commandeers the battleship, saying that Odani Castle will be defenseless against it. As the Genma are dispatched, the Oni Genbu takes off to the skies, leaving the two behind. The sacred place begins to crumble, and the two find a room with a far smaller vessel. As the two realise that they can chase the Genbu with it, a warning is broadcast that the area is about to explode, and the two open the door to allow the small vessel to launch. They pilot it and catch up to the Genbu, landing on the outside of the battleship and breaking through a window to get inside. Jubi runs ahead, reaching the control room and confronting Tokuchiro. But before he can stop the Oni, Jubei slays the Genma soldiers immediately, with one staggering back and landing on the steering wheel, veering the ship off course and forcing Tokuchiro to flee in the confusion. Oyu enters and is forced to take a hold of the wheel while Jubei chases Tokuchiro, finding him attempting to escape the ship. Tokuchiro tells Jubei to give up, but Jubei reinforces the Yagyu's obligation to fight all Genma. As he prepares to fight, Tokuchiro desperately offers the ship to Jubei, but quickly throws his sword, fleeing as Jubei dodges the attack. Oyu barely turns away from Odani Castle in time, and Jubei quickly finds the controls that allow the ship to attack, successfully decimating Oda's army before it can complete the assault. Tokuchiro's surprise attack, however, managed to somehow damage the Genbu systems, causing it to lose power and slowly explode. Realising the situation, Jubei tells Oyu to head for Gifu Castle so that they can confront Nobunaga. The now burning battleship crashes down next to the castle, and Jubei manages to jump free, but before she can follow, the ship tumbles over, causing Oyu to tumble into the fires inside. Assuming her to be dead, Jubei moves through the castle, but encounters Eke in the middle of killing Genma. He gleefully tells Jubei that he has managed to find a way to achieve his dream, saying that he had a chance meeting with the senior statesman Motoharo Kikawa, and the two got along extremely well due to their shared interest in booze and women, leading to Eke being hired to serve under Motonari Mori. The two celebrate by killing approaching Genma, 
After which Eke bids Jubei a hearty goodbye, clearly elated at this new development. Jubei continues, finding a massive Guran on the roof. Jubei slays it and retrieves a golden scale, which is used to dispel the barrier in front of the Genma structure attached to Gifu Castle. Jubei also finds a purple wedge, which allows him to access the purple phantom realm. Successfully reaching the bottom, Jubei manages to find the Oni weapon Rekka Ken, a ridiculously powerful Oni weapon of fire. With this in hand, he enters the Genma structure but is confronted once again by Ginkenfats, calling this battle his revenge. During the fight he separates himself from his lower body, forcing Jubei to fight outnumbered, but even with this advantage, Jubei defeats the Genma causing him to fall into a burning pit, preventing him from being able to revive himself. He finds the only strength orb in Ginkenfatz's weapon being the final Oni orb that he needed. He uses the orb to activate the lift, but before he uses it, Oyu appears, clearly having survived falling into the burning wreckage of the Oni Genbu. The two embrace and Jubei tells her to leave, saying that she cannot get involved since she is Nobunaga's sister. Oyu clearly tries to say something and the two finally share a kiss. Jubei wishes for her to find happiness and descends in the lift, leaving Oyu to weep before she finally leaves. Jubei enters a chamber drawing his weapon against Nobunaga, but the warlord has already transferred his power to the now completed golden evil statue claiming that any who see it will kneel. Jubei refuses, saying that no one will serve someone who has sold his soul to the Genma, and Nobunaga calls him unworthy before transforming into a full-on Genma. The two enter a long battle, with Nobunaga regularly using elemental magic against the Oni, but Jubei eventually proves too much and comes out the victor. In his final moments, Nobunaga manages to activate the statue and Jubei is dragged through the floor into a grotesque environment, with the fully activated statue readying itself. Jubei reinforces his faith in the Oni and absorbs the five Oni orbs, transforming himself into a true Oni Musha, a cannon-like weapon appearing on his right arm. This increase in strength allows him to successfully dismantle and eventually destroy the statue after a long struggle, with Nobunaga's visage appearing on the bloody moon above, cursing Jubei and vowing to return once again. Jubei escapes the Genma structure as it crumbles to the ground, leaving both Nobunaga and the statue to die inside. As before, the death of the Genma Lord forces the Genma to retreat in full, their plans once again shattered. Thanks to Jubei's attempts to weaken the attacking army, Odani Castle also managed to survive the events. Sometime after, Oichi returns to Odani Castle, now accepting Nagamasa's children as her own, and Jubei, now in temporary hiding after his campaign against the Genma, is seen on horseback looking towards the castle with Oichi looking back, the both of them remembering each other. Unfortunately, sometime afterwards, Guildenstern successfully resurrects Nobunaga a second time, and he spends more time regaining his full strength. Jubei eventually returns to the Yagyu village, and begins the process of rebuilding after Nobunaga's assault. Meanwhile, in the Foggy Valley, Kaede overhears the sound of somebody fighting Genma while on a mission of her own. After defeating a doppelganger that blocks her path, she catches up with the warrior, who reveals himself to be Samanosuke, apologising for hiding from her due to the fear of harming her with the power of the Onimusha. After their reunion, Samanosuke gets back in contact with Mitsuhide, joining Kaede as his agent, and the two begin travelling and fighting together again. Another familiar face also re-emerged, arriving back from his overseas travels. Yumimaru, now going by the name Kaijiro Maeda, had become a highly skilled and renowned Naginata user, returning to Japan in order to aid in the fight against the Genma. Sometime after Nobunaga's defeat, Kotaro comes into contact with Oichi, and after learning that his mother was killed by the Fuma clan not for abandoning him, but for trying to escape with him so that he wouldn't become a ninja and put his life in danger, manages to bury the hatchet with her. From this point on, the two are no longer enemies. Sometime after Samurai's Destiny, 
Tokichiro, now named Hideyoshi Hashiba, led Nobunaga's armies during the warlord's absence, helping it grow in power, resulting in Nobunaga's trust in the general significantly increasing. Once Nobunaga returned to power once again, Hideyoshi was sent with an army of 30,000 troops in order to suppress the western lands. This leads us to the events of Onimusha Blade Warriors. With Nobunaga's strength slowly restoring, he and the Genma resume their conquest of Japan, which is noticed by Semenosuke and Kaede. The two begin fighting back against them, which does not go unnoticed. Makoichi also decides fighting the Genma, recognising that his former allies have begun to oppose them. He soon decides that he isn't strong enough, and believes that the Oni power present in the Oni sacred place was still there, meaning he could potentially gain that power and even become an Oni warrior. Somewhere else, Kotaro overhears some soldiers nervously discussing rumours of a warrior that can absorb Genma souls using a gauntlet. Intrigued, Kotaro decides to investigate further. Magoichi runs into Kaede, who has just finished killing Genma, and Magoichi notices the power emanating from her sacred knife, and she tells him that only power is held within it, and mentioning that she is fighting alongside the warrior with the gauntlet. Magoichi responds by saying that he also fights with an Oni warrior. Gen must suddenly appear before the conversation can continue, and Magoichi decides to face them, telling Kaede to leave. It's not actually confirmed whether or not Magoichi managed to receive any power from the Oni island. The knowledge of a second Oni warrior shocks Kaede, who decides to investigate and report this to Samonosuke. Jubei, still overseeing the rebuilding of Yagyu village, is visited by Kotaro, who notices that the rebuilding is going well. He then reports to Jubei that another warrior has been reported to have been fighting the Genma, and more importantly, he sports a strange gauntlet that allows him to absorb Genma souls similar to Jubei. This gets Jubei's attention, and he asks Kotaro to investigate further, hoping that this could lead to a potential alliance. Meanwhile, Eke, who while enjoying working for Motonari Mori, expresses a desire not for his skills to get rusty, and he is soon met by Kotaro, who mentions that the Genma are back, but Eke doesn't want to get involved. Kotaro mentions that Jubei and the other Onimusha are both away, which gets Eke's attention, but Kotaro leaves without clarifying since it has nothing to do with Eke. Tired of women and booze, Eke decides to join the fight. Kotaro in the Bamboo Forest is followed and intercepted by Kaede, who suspects that he is investigating Nobunaga and Semenosuke. Kotaro tells her who he is, and that he is searching for a man with Oni power. Kaede tells him her name, which he recognises as the one who fights with the Oni warrior. She is apprehensive to talk, so he tells her that Jubei Yagyu has Oni blood, and sent Kataro to find the other Oni after hearing of him. Kaede reveals him as Semenosuke Akechi, saying that she is investigating Oda for him. After dispatching nearby Genma, the two part ways to report to their respective allies. On the way to Semenosuke, Kaede is met by Kaijiro, who reveals himself as Yumimaru. Kaede tells him that she and Samonosuke are investigating Nobunaga, and Kaijiro, ecstatic that Samonosuke is still alive, decides to aid them as a way to repay them for their help over a decade prior. Kaede soon finds Samonosuke and reports her meeting with Kataro, revealing the existence of Jubei Yagyu to him. Intrigued, Samonosuke asks her to arrange a meeting with him. Kataro calls Jubei to the Foggy Forest and tells him much the same, while also mentioning that he and Kaede had arranged a meeting there. Kataro leaves, allowing Jubei and Kaede to begin discussions, and when asked to meet Samonosuke, Kaede first asks for Jubei to prove that he is an Oni warrior. With Genma appearing nearby, the two fight them off, and Kaede, recognising his Oni power in battle, agrees to arrange a meeting for the two warriors and leaves. Kotaro reappears, satisfied at the meeting's outcome, but also reports that Odani Castle is in danger. Jubei, unable to bring himself to help her, asks Kotaro to do so himself, which he agrees. 
Gotaro arrives in time to find Oyu, who asks him to save her children while she is left to die with the castle. But Katara mentions that Jubei is still fighting, renewing Oyu's hope, so he leaves her to fight off the Genma while he saves the children. After escaping the Odani castle siege, Kotaro tells Oyu to meet by a waterfall, but when she gets there, she is instead met by Jubei, who tells her that Kotaro managed to save the children from the castle. He asks her to help him defeat Nobunaga again, and Oyu, initially wanting to settle it alone since she is his sister, agrees to work together again. In the bamboo forest, Kaijiro, now accompanying Samanosuke, asks about his gauntlet, and Samanosuke reveals that after noticing the inhuman scars on Fortinbras' dead body, scars that humans couldn't make, he realised how dangerous his only power would be if he couldn't control it, which is why he disappeared. Later, Kaede reports to Samanosuke that she has arranged a meeting for him with Jubei, but becomes worried about the end result of their battle with Nobunaga. Kaijiro spells it out that Kaede is terrified that Samanosuke may not survive, and Samanosuke assures her that he will. In Imasho, Jubei is met again by Kaede, who confirms that Samanosuke wants to meet, giving Jubei hope that Nobunaga can be defeated. Soon after she leaves, Eke appears, greeting Jubei and asking about the second Onimusha. Jubei confirms the rumour, saying that the two are trying to meet. Eke jokes that things are getting more interesting, and as more Genma appear, the two fight them off together. Afterwards, Jubei and Samanosuke finally meet in an open field, initially crossing swords to witness each other's only power, which appear to be evenly matched. The two recognise each other's ability, and agree to form an alliance to defeat Nobunaga. The two manage to track down the Warlord, and with their combined strength, successfully defeat him. With this, the two, satisfied that their mission is complete, go their separate ways. Once again, the Genma retreat with Nobunaga defeated, but Guildenstern again revives the Warlord, who decides this time to spend more time regaining his full strength before resuming his conquest. Jubei retires to the Yagyu village, dedicating himself to its rebuilding and teaching the next generation of Yagyus not only the way of the sword, but also of the Yagyu's blood-bound alliance with the Oni clan. Samanosuke and Kaede continued their work as Mitsuhide's agents, and continued to fight against the Genma wherever they appeared. At some point, Mitsuhide, now a retainer to Nobunaga due to the destruction of the Saito clan years prior, begins to plot a rebellion against the Warlord in the hopes of someday destroying him once and for all, something that Samanosuke and Kaede, and eventually Nobunaga, are aware of. Over time, Nobunaga once again resumes his campaign of conquest, and this time the Genma warrior Garganto becomes involved. At some point, Samanosuke and Kaede encounter this warrior, and during a battle, Kaede is killed. Samanosuke and Garganto both escape the battle with their lives, but a now mourning Samanosuke vows revenge against the Genma. At some point after Blade Warriors, Nobunaga ends up marrying another Genma named Vega Donna, though the circumstances of their meeting, as well as Nobunaga's genuine views of her, are never revealed. In 1574, Ieyasu Tokugawa, as a result of an affair with the handmaiden of his current wife, Lady Sukiyama, known as Lady Oman, fathers a child named Ogimaru Tokugawa, who was born with Oni blood, suggesting that Lady Oman was in fact a descendant of the Oni clan. Unbeknownst to all, except perhaps his mother, Ogimaru not only held Oni blood, but was in fact the reincarnation of the Oni God of Darkness, making him the infamous Black Oni, the most powerful Oni alive. At some point in his life, his mother had gifted him an Oni broadsword called Lamentation, before she eventually disappeared. This finally leads us to the events of Onimusha 3 Demon Siege. In 1582, sometime after Kaede's death, Nobunaga relocated himself to Hanoji Temple, requesting Garganto to deliver reinforcements in order to quell Mitsuhide's incoming rebellion. Garganto responds by attempting to deliver significant Genma forces using a Genma tank. 
However, Samanosuke is able to intercept and infiltrate the tank mid-transit. Fighting his way through, he eventually reaches the main control chamber where he is met with two powerful spear-wielding Genma. But Garganto appears, demanding the two Genma to back off so that he can face Samanosuke alone. The two fight, with Garganto disarming Samanosuke briefly before Samanosuke gains his sword back, and the Oni manages to land on top of the pod that held Garganto after trying to gain some distance. Realising that it was suspended above the tank's brain, he severs the tube holding it up, causing it to fall and destroy the brain below, despite Garganto's attempts to stop him. Samanosuke escapes the crumbling tank, using Shippu to break his fall, but is caught in the explosion as the tank finally dies. Samanosuke manages to survive the blast, but finds Garganto also alive as well, the two being the only ones able to survive. Preparing for one final conflict, Samanosuke absorbs the souls of the surrounding Genma as Garganto draws his sword, allowing him to transform into his Oni form. This gives him enough strength to easily overpower Garganto and destroy him, finally avenging Kaede's death. Nobunaga notices immediately the death of Garganto while in Honoji and suspects Samanosuke to be the cause. With the Genma reinforcements dealt with, Samanosuke travels to Honoji to meet with Mitsuhide in order to aid in his final attack. Before this occurs, Guildenstern is given a task by Nobunaga to discover a way to travel through time in order to spread his influence across the ages, and Guildenstern revisits the Oni Temple, using it as a base to begin his research. He discovers a strange device created by the Oni and begins to attempt to reverse engineer it, discovering that the Oni were attempting to find a way to travel through time. Eventually, he uses it as a blueprint to create a device of his own known as the Time Folder and accidentally activates it, sending himself forward to the year 2004. Luckily for him, the Undersea Temple continues to exist in this era, so Guildenstern manages to create a somewhat functional link between the two ages, eventually enabling him to bring with him a legion of Genma, soon creating another base of operations in Paris in the basement of Notre Dame. He creates a teleporter, allowing for easy travel between there and the temple, and he launches his attack on the modern day city. While this is occurring, he also continues his usual efforts in creating new Genma, notably using the monkeys from Bologna Zoo to create the Genma known as Zmo. With Mont Saint-Michel also existing in both eras, Guildenstern made it another base of operations in both eras, housing a prototype time folder inside in the future to act as a link to the past and allow travel for now. In the past, he uses his staff to shine a light that turns a number of local humans into docile slaves, though one Frenchman was unaffected by the sight and managed to escape. These slaves worked endlessly under the cruel and watchful eyes of Vega Donna, who is cultivating a Genma capable of carrying a weaponized fortress on its back. Meanwhile, a member of the 29th SA Operations Division of the French military, Jacques Blanc, is on the phone to his son Henri when he is contacted by Philippe, another member of his squad, saying that they need his help. In 1582, Samanosuke arrives at Hanoji Temple to meet with Mitsuhide, and as a reward for his efforts, Samanosuke is presented with a new suit of chainmail armour. Donning this new armour, Mitsuhide launches his attack on the temple, and Samanosuke follows, effortlessly fighting his way to the temple itself, confronting Nobunaga. However, the Oda clan's head retainer, the young Ranmaru Mori, chooses to face Samanosuke first. Ranmaru proves far too weak for Samanosuke, and the Oni effortlessly cuts him down. After a brief standoff, Nobunaga begins launching Genma magic at Samanosuke, soon incapacitating him. But as he is about to finish the warrior, a temporal distortion appears on the ground, causing the confused Nobunaga to back off. Samanosuke and the body of Ranmaru are both trapped inside the time fold as they are warped across time, leaving Nobunaga alone. In the future, Philippe and his squad open fire on an army of Zorm, initially killing a few of them, 
but Philippe is quickly injured by another, leaving his squad to be slaughtered one by one. Before they can finish off Philippe, Jacques manages to reach them, crushing the nearby swarm with his bike and fighting off the rest. Once they're gone, he tries to get Philippe to safety, but another group of Zorm appear, forcing him to keep fighting. The previous Timefold appears in an alley behind him, but before he can figure out what it is, he keeps his focus on the Genma. As the distortion fades, Samanosuke wakes up, wondering what happened, only to notice that the only power in his gauntlet has been somehow drained, also leaving him without his only weapons, likely also displaced elsewhere. Samanosuke notices Jacques fighting off the Zorm, and as the Frenchman runs out of ammunition, manages to kill the remaining Genma, saving Jacques' life. Samanosuke asks where they are, but the language barrier prevents communication, so Samanosuke simply leaves them. As he does, another distortion appears, this time catching Jacques and the now dying Philippe inside, warping them away. Samanosuke, unable to stop it, finds a phone on the ground, and as he picks it up, notices a familiar Genma on top of the Arc de Triomphe. Fighting through more Zorm, Samanosuke reaches the Arc de Triomphe, and the Brazier reacts to his gauntlet, revealing a chamber that holds a dragon orb, granting Samanosuke the only weapon, Tenso, dual swords that harness the power of light. As he exits, warning shots are fired at his feet by another member of the French army, Lieutenant Michel Aubeur. Samanosuke attempts to leave, but she shouts at him to stop. But continued orders are interrupted as more soldiers storm the Ark. Michelle orders her squad to follow, but as the two attempt to find a way past the language barrier, Michelle rushes off when she hears her squad being killed by Genma, Samanosuke chasing her. Michelle finds them all dead and is soon attacked by a Zagat, who manages to knock her unconscious, but Samanosuke arrives in time to kill it along with the other Zagats that appear soon after, before any of them can finish her off. With them dead, he carries an unconscious Michelle outside, leaving her to rest while he climbs the Ark. Samanosuke reaches the top and confronts the familiar Genma, Gildenstern, who notes that the time fold is still unstable, revealing to Samanosuke that he is responsible for the time distortions. Gildenstern tells the Oni that they are in Paris 500 years after the Age of Warring States, and that he has begun an operation here at Nobunaga's orders. He refuses to reveal his plan, and summons his latest Genma creation, the mechanical Brainstern, and flees, leaving Samanosuke to face it. Despite its advanced weapons and metal body, Samanosuke defeats it, leaving him to ponder Gildenstern's next move. In 1582, ten days before the assault on Hanoji Temple, the time fold that carried Jacques and Philippe appears at Mount Hie, and after collecting himself, quickly checks on Philippe, who unfortunately succumbs to his wounds, wishing that he could have died instead with his wife and child. A mournful Jacques leaves him to rest and begins exploring, but soon he is screaming, catching his attention. Rushing towards it, he finds that his son Henri is being attacked by a gacha, and when his sidearm proves ineffective, rushes it only to be knocked aside. Henri faints in fear, and Jacques gets back up, only to find his arm covered in magic, forming an Oni gauntlet and also granting him the Oni whip, which he uses to successfully defeat the gacha. Rushing to Henri, the boy suddenly fades and the energy that formed him converges until it reveals an Oni god, who speaks into Jacques's mind in order to bypass the language barrier. He tells Jacques where and when he is, and says that Henri never left Jacques's time since the Henri he just saw was just an illusion. The Oni God tells of the Genma that are attempting to dominate humanity, and that in ten days, the Oni warrior Samanosuke would face Nobunaga at Hanoji Temple, telling Jacques that to return home, he will need to aid Samanosuke against Nobunaga. Jacques is defiant, but the Oni God assigns a member of the Crow Tengu clan to help him. The Oni God disappears, and the Tengu appears at Jacques' feet as he is demanding more answers, introducing herself as Akko. She tells him that her presence allows anyone to surpass language barriers, but Jacques literally brushes her off, focused solely on finding a way back to his time. He begins moving through the area and is soon met by Samanosuke. 
and the two fight off nearby Genma. Samonosuke notices the gauntlet on Jacques' arm, but Jacques quickly recognises him as the samurai that appeared in Paris, demanding to know how to return, confusing Samonosuke, but Arko quickly mediates, telling Jacques that this is the Oni warrior mentioned by the Oni god. Jacques explains the situation, and Samonosuke tells him that Mount Hiei became a cesspool for Genma after Nobunaga burnt the temple. Jacques finally concedes that beating the Genma is his only way of getting home, and formally introduces himself, forming an alliance between them. Further up the mountain, the two come across a monument, and noticing that one of the bronze mirrors is missing, the two split up and search for it. Jacques soon finds it nearby, after encountering a group of Oni fireflies to help him traverse the area, and once it's returned, the monument lowers itself, revealing an Oni ring that resonates with Jacques' gauntlet, since it uses rings rather than dragon orbs. This ring grants Jacques the Oni weapon Enja, a sword whip that harnesses fire. With this, he cuts down the Genma weeds and rendezvous with Samonosuke, using a key hidden behind more weeds to open a door leading to the Enryaku Temple. Inside, the two are confronted by Ranmaru Mori, who mockingly refers to Jacques as a barbarian mercenary. Jacques asks why Ranmaru serves Nobunaga, since he is still human, but Ranmaru sees no point in answering, summoning a revived Marcellus to kill them. Ranmaru leaves, laughing that Nobunaga already knows about Mitsuhide's rebellion. Samonosuke gives chase, leaving Jacques to face Marcellus. Despite his lack of experience fighting Genma, Marcellus is once again beaten, exhausting Jacques who refuses to die before seeing his son again. Arko says that she will hop forward in time to reassure the boy, demanding that Jacques start appreciating her now. In 2004, Michelle slowly comes too, only to find Samonosuke approaching, activating her fight or flight instinct. But before she can pull the trigger, Arko suddenly appears in front of them. She quickly greets Samonosuke, who doesn't recognise her, and after a moment, Arko realises that this is a different Samonosuke due to the 10 day difference in the initial time distortions, effectively changing history. She introduces herself and Michelle tries to run back into the Ark, but Samonosuke stops her, apologising for not being able to save her friends. Michelle is angered by the Genma's cruelty, but quickly realises that she can understand him now, with Arko explaining that she is responsible. Arko tells Samonosuke that he can't return to 1582 until the Genma are beaten here, and that Jacques is fighting the Genma in his time. Michelle jumps at hearing Jacques's name, ecstatic that he's still alive and telling them that she is in fact his fiance. The two question how he can be in the past, but Michelle is contacted by more of her squad, requesting help with Genma in the sewers. Samonosuke agrees to help save them, and the two enter the sewers, restoring the power and fighting through the Genma inside. After Samonosuke cuts a damaged chain to a cleaning ball to get rid of garbage block in the way, Michelle is contacted again by her squad, requesting urgent help with more Genma. The two are forced to push the cleaning ball through the sewage to reach the troops, and are able to reach them before the Genma finish them off. The two leave the sewers, appearing in front of the cathedral Notre Dame. Arko tells him what a cathedral is, comparing it to a large temple, and the phone Samonosuke picked up earlier starts ringing. Michelle takes the phone, hoping that it's Jacques, but it's revealed to instead be Henri, trying to contact his father. After the call ends, she awkwardly explains what the phone is, and the two head to Jacques' house to meet Henri. Henri lets them in, asking where Jacques is and who Samonosuke is, and Michelle says that he won't be back soon, only for Arko to appear and explain further. After all is made clear, Michelle tries to comfort Henri, but he reacts poorly, worrying Arko. Regardless, Arko returns to the past now that her message from Jacques is delivered. She returns to Jacques, reassuring him that Henri is fine, but commenting that he and Michelle don't get along, which he confirms. She says Samonosuke is counting on him, reminding him of the second Samonosuke in the future, and they prepare to leave the temple. Before leaving, Jacques overhears beeping inside some of the crates opening them to reveal a collection of wristwatches from his time, confusing him. Samonosuke returns and says that they are likely from Sakai in Senshu. Jacques asks if he caught Ranmaru, but Samonosuke simply shakes his head. He quickly notices the stamp of a Sakai merchant on the crates, saying that it is a port city that trades with the West, 
and Jacques suggests heading there next. The two arrive and split up to search the city. Jacques enters the Torea shop and questions the merchant about the watches. He is apprehensive, arousing suspicion, but quickly shoos Jacques out of the store, refusing to answer further questions. Jacques finds an only firefly after trading items and manages to enter the shop through an upper window. He manages to overhear the merchant and his employee discussing a soon to arrive western ship. The employee expresses concern about the monsters on it, but the merchant shuts him down, calling them important clients, and the two leave for the harbour. Jacques finds a key to the blacksmiths, and upon exiting the store, the city is attacked by Genma. He fights his way to the blacksmith where he finds another Oni ring, allowing him to use the Oni weapon Reizen, an extendable double spear that harnesses lightning. With his new weapon, Jacques fights his way to the harbour and enters a storehouse, where he finds one of Guildenstern's time lab journals. Samanosuke arrives with knowledge of the western ship, and Jacques shows him the journal. Samanosuke is angered at Guildenstern's involvement, and when asked, Arco tells Jacques that he is a Genma scientist that schemes and develops new Genma. After a moment of thought, he decides that they should check the ship. Upon finding it, Arco suggests that it may take them to the Genma hideout, but before they can board, Jacques notices his motorbike nearby, clearly also displaced by the unstable time fold. They are soon intercepted by the spearman Tadakatsu Heihachiro Honda, who recognises Samanosuke and challenges him to a duel. Ako explains that Heihachi is a vassal of Ieyasu Tokugawa, making him an ally of Nobunaga, but notices the ship leaving so the pair of Oni attempt to end the fight quickly. After a struggle, Heihachi stops the fight, acknowledging their strength, and leaves promising to win next time. The two question how they reach the now escaping ship when Jacques tries to use his bike, only to find the key missing. He sends Arco to retrieve it, but in the future, Henri somehow knows that Jacques needs his key, confusing Michelle. Arco arrives, and Henri gives her the key, and Arco returns it to Jacques, saying that Henri had it ready for her. Samanosuke agrees to split up, and Jacques rides his bike to the edge of the harbour, ramping off some storage crates and using his only whip to pull himself onto the ship, leaving the bike to fall into the ocean. On board the ship, he fights off the Genma and takes the key to the captain's cabin, only to find the wheel stuck in place with some strange mechanisms attached, figuring that the ship was in some form of autopilot. As he leaves the cabin, the ship begins to submerge, now making its way to the Genma hideout. Thankfully, the ship proves to be watertight, so Jacques remains safe inside for the journey. He then asks Akko to return to Henri, thanking him for his help, and to tell Michelle to look after him. Akko agrees and relays both messages to them, and Samanosuke decides to leave with her, but Jacques' phone rings before he can. Michelle gives him the phone, saying that the call is for him, and the caller turns out to be Guildenstern, who tells him to come to the basement of Notre Dame before hanging up. Samanosuke tells Michelle to stay with Henri and leaves. In Sakai, Samanosuke turns to leave, only to encounter Heihachi again. Readying himself, Heihachi apologises, saying that he only wanted to test Samanosuke's strength. But before he can say why, the Torea merchant rushes to him, telling him the Genma are continuing to attack the town. Heihachi remembers the town's drawbridge, but the merchant says that it's broken and that a blacksmith was asked to repair it. Samanosuke agrees to hold off the Genma at the drawbridge while Heihachi finds the needed part to repair it. Meanwhile, in 2004, Samanosuke arrives to Notre Dame and fights through more Genma, uncovering an entrance to the basement at an altar. At this point, the basement has been remodeled to be far more gory in appearance, with bladed traps installed for Samanosuke to navigate. He finds an anti-darkness charm, giving his gauntlet the ability to absorb darkness itself. He uses this new ability to cleanse the four statues of darkness in the cathedral, which awakens the dragon orb for Samanosuke to use. This grants him the only weapon, Kuga, a large nodachi that harnesses air. He uses this weapon to open the way further through the basement and eventually reaches Guildenstern, who tells Samanosuke that he is researching time folds. Succeeding in this would allow him to move across time at will with him planning to bring Nobunaga and the Genma to the future to take over the world here as well. 
Samanosuke opposes him, and Gilderson summons two Dordo to stop him as he escapes, teleporting himself to the Undersea Temple. Samanosuke dispatches the two Genma and follows, appearing in the temple only for Arko to notice the same ship that Jacques boarded. However, when she attempts to hop across time to Jacques, she finds herself unable, presuming that the flow of time in the temple is no longer stable, perhaps even damaged. The two manage to find an Oni device similar to an Oni mirror that allows Arko to travel back towards Jacques, and she finds him as he disembarks from the ship. He greets her and asks if this is the Genma hideout, and she says that the future Samonosuke is also here and that the same ship is docked here too, albeit worn and torn. Jacques believes that both time periods are now linking together, asserting that something needs to be done about it. Both warriors use the Oni Time Mirror to transfer key items between eras, allowing access to more parts of the temple. Soon, Jacques enters the Eastern Chamber, and upon finding another Time Lab journal, is met by Ranmaru. The young retainer tells Jacques that an unfinished time folder was built here by Guildenstern, and when asked where it is, Ranmaru simply tells Jacques to find it himself, but to be careful of the guard dog as he leaves. Now knowing that both eras are flowing alongside each other, Jacques uses this knowledge to aid Samanosuke by manipulating certain events, such as using key discs in his time to open a chamber for both, or draining water so that it also drains in the future. Samanosuke enters the Eastern Chamber himself, finding one of the discs, and is met once again by Guildenstern who compliments him, and offers a surprise to reward his progress. This surprise turns out to be a Genma mutated Ranmaru, the same Ranmaru whose body was dragged to the future with Samanosuke, now revived by Guildenstern. The Genma scientist leaves them to fight, and Samanosuke looks in horror at what Ranmaru has become, only to be manically shut down by the Genma mutant initiating a duel. Despite his heightened strength and speed, Samanosuke defeats him due to his body still fighting the Genma blood that now runs through him causing Ranmaru to flee. Meanwhile, Heihachi makes his way to the blacksmith in Sakai, only to find the apprentice alone after his master was killed by Genma. He hands Heihachi a note saying that the Genma have stolen a material necessary for fixing the bridge, and that only dust would open a temporary portal to find them and retrieve it. The apprentice gives the dust to Heihachi, who throws it into the fire to create a portal taking him to the Undersea Temple. Eventually, Jacques finds his way through the Western Chamber, and traverses the upper pathway above the Western Ship to find another Oni Ring, granting him Hayosai, the Oni Flail that utilises ice. This allows him to break the seal to the Power Room, doing the same for Samanosuke, and through a chain of item transfers, Jacques removes the Power Crystal, shutting off power to the Temple. Upon exiting the Power Room, Jacques encounters Heihachi fighting off Genma, having just recovered the Iron Stone needed to repair the drawbridge. Jacques initially tries to question him, but Heihachi simply leaves, laughing as he goes, confusing Jacques and Akko, both thinking that he was supposed to be allied with the Genma. Heihachi manages to escape the temple before the portal closes, and the apprentice instructs him to gather sea water to forge the gear for the bridge. Heihachi does so, and the apprentice successfully forges the Crimson Gear, which Heihachi uses to raise the drawbridge and cut off the Genma from the town. However, more Genma manage to appear from within, and the two are forced to fight them off. Afterwards, Heihachi attempts to part ways with Samanosuke, but is stopped when Samanosuke points out that due to Tokugawa's alliance with Nobunaga, fighting the Genma is equivalent to treason, asking what he's really up to. Heihachi dodges the question, and bids Samanosuke farewell. Back in the temple, Jacques sends the power crystal to the future, allowing Samanosuke to power the temple, activating the lifts. This allows him to find another Oni orb, granting him the Oni weapon, Chigo, a large axe that harnesses earth. The two Oni each traverse the area, until they both run into a Mino clan member, with one immediately recognising Samanosuke's gauntlet likely realising him to be the same Oni that defeated Fortinbras. Both offer passage to the Dark Realm, granting small rewards to both. 
Afterwards, Samonosuke uses Chigo to unseal a room and finds the final control disc, sending it to Jacques and opening the northern chamber. Inside, Jacques runs into the aforementioned guard dog, a Genma known as Gertrude, reminiscent of the mythical Cerberus, and is forced to face it. Jacques successfully defeats it, but rather than shrivel up like most Genma, Gertrude is turned to stone. Unfortunately, as it fell, Gertrude's body hit a window, causing it to crack and eventually shatter, flooding the temple. Jacques and Arco flee further through the northern chamber, climbing a large flight of stairs until reaching a Genma train, successfully boarding it before it can leave without them. After a moment of reflection, Jacques decides to get some rest, and Arco returns to the future, telling Samonosuke of the train, hoping that one also exists here. Samonosuke enters the northern chamber, but is ambushed by Genma Ranmaru, who, after trading a couple of blows, activates a machine that incapacitates Samonosuke, maniacally raving about turning him into a Genma rather than simply torturing him to death. Ranmaru leaves laughing, and Samonosuke disappears, leaving Akko alone. Back in Paris, Henri, sick of doing nothing, leaves to find Samonosuke despite Michelle's protests, aggressively pushing her away. Michelle loses him and enters Notre Dame, assuming him to have gone there. She fights her way through the Genma into the basement, and after fighting off two more Dordo, finds a report mentioning that Bologna Zoo would be used as a new Genma experimentation facility. Soon after finding it, Arco finds Michelle, reporting Samonosuke's capture, only to be told that Henri is missing too. Michelle asserts that they were both taken to the Bologna Zoo and begin driving there. In Bologna Zoo, Samonosuke reassures Henri that Michelle is coming for them. Arriving at the zoo, Michelle explores the area until she finds a Genma device that lowers multiple cages. While two each held a Zmo inside, one held a dead human captive and the key to start the boat in the zoo's canal. She uses the key to start the boat, and during the trip, Akko asks why Michelle and Henri aren't on good terms. Michelle tells her that Henri's mother died in a car accident while protecting him, causing him to blame himself as a result, and holding a grudge to any potential replacements for her, not wanting another mother. The boat's motor suddenly breaks down, and Michelle is attacked by a Zagat and a Batabone, which she quickly dispatches. Akko worries that the boat is beyond repair, but Michelle literally kickstarts the motor, and they arrive at the Animal Research Centre. Inside, Michelle enters the basement and finds Samonosuke and Henri in cells, successfully freeing them. As she and Henri are about to embrace, Gildan soon appears and kidnaps them, preparing to transform them into Genma. Samonosuke, now free, further explores the zoo until unlocking a room previously locked off to Michelle, and finds the key needed to access Gildenstern's research area. He reaches the scientist as he's about to begin experimenting on Henri, and Gildenstern raises them to the ceiling, finally preparing to fight Samonosuke himself. Throughout the fight, he continuously raises dark puppets to outnumber Samonosuke and even attempts to trap him in a distortion to send him backwards in time. But Samonosuke overcomes his nemesis, finally bringing down one of his longest time foes. On his deathbed, Gildenstern gloats that his time folder is already complete and that his death won't stop the Genma. Samonosuke demands to know where it is, but Gildenstern revels in its creation before finally succumbing to his wounds. Samonosuke frees Michelle and Henri, and the group find a portrait of Mont Saint Michel, presuming that to be the machine's location. Michelle drives them there, but on the way, Arco notices Henri's continued antagonism towards Michelle and visits Jacques, asking him for a keepsake from his deceased wife to give to Henri. Jacques gives Akko his wife's ring, and Akko gives it to Henri, using it to connect Henri to his mother's spirit in the afterlife. She assures him that her death was not his fault, and asks him to open himself up to others. Henri tearfully says he understands as they part, and they soon arrive at Mont Saint Michel. Samonosuke goes ahead, leaving Michel to watch over Henri, and with the flow of time also being damaged here, Arco is forced again to use the only time mirror to travel back and forth between eras. In the past, Jacques arrives via the Genma train to Mont Saint Michel, recognizing the structure. Arco arrives and Jacques asks if he made it back home, but Arco says no, but keeps him in high enough spirits to continue. They are then confronted again by Heihachi, 
but before he can tell Jacques why he's here, he notices Vega Donna above him and suddenly attacks, starting another duel. Jacques manages to fight back long enough for Vega to cackle and drop from her perch, surprising Jacques. She orders Heihachi to kill Jacques, but after hesitating, Heihachi finally refuses, saying that he can't do this anymore because he hates taking orders, and leaves, angering the Genma who gives chase. Jacques simply quips about his inability to keep up with so many new Genma, and begins exploring the area, meeting and saving French slaves from Genma. Sending items between errors, Jacques is able to solve a puzzle that creates a large stairway for himself and Samonosuke, which leads to them meeting their respective Mino Gatekeeper again and accessing the Dark Realm. Samonosuke uses this new staircase to access the room housing the now deactivated Time Folder, and finds an unstable distortion that takes him to a displaced and warped version of the Arc de Triomphe. He climbs to the top of the monument and finds a key, and after escaping the distortion, sends the key to Jacques, who uses it to access a room filled with French slaves, witnessing Vega Donna cruelly demanding them to keep working, warning severe punishment for those who don't. After she leaves, Jacques quickly herds them out of the room, telling them to escape, and fighting off the Genma that attempt to stop them. After leaving the room, Heihachi appears and throws him another key, directing him to the storehouse where more prisoners are being kept. He silently leaves and Jacques heeds the Spearman's advice, saving more slaves on the way. True to Heihachi's word, Jacques finds more prisoners locked inside, but as he tries to help them, the castle begins to rumble, causing them to flee in fear, screaming that the castle has awoken. Jacques finds a Genma plant, which he plants in some nearby soil, allowing it to grow over time until it's large and strong enough for Samanosuke to climb down. Doing so, he enters the storehouse himself and finds an iron gear, which he attempts to use to open the gate to the monastery, but when he tries, the lever breaks due to the centuries of rust that have accumulated. Instead, he sends the gear to Jacques, who is able to open the gate and enter the main building, but when Jacques enters the basement, a trap is sprung, locking him inside and the room fills with toxic gas, threatening to suffocate him. As he begins to lose consciousness, Henri somehow senses that Jacques is in danger and tries to rush off, with Michel initially stopping him, but instead deciding to go with him when he says that Jacques is in trouble. She clears a path through the Genma and the two reach Semenosuke, who questions why they're here, but as they're explaining, Arco manages to hop through time to reach them, explaining that he is trapped in a machine they can't figure out in the building's basement. Due to Jacques opening the gate, they are now able to enter the monastery, and Henri manages to work out how to disarm the trap. With this knowledge, Henri is somehow able to connect to Jacques through time, and manages to tell him the combination to disarm the trap, which vents the gas and unlocks the door, saving his father's life. As they are celebrating the success, a screen turns on with a transmission from Genma Ranmaru, telling Samanosuke that the completed time folder is being activated. Michelle recognises that it's at the Eiffel Tower, and Ranmaru detonates the machinery in an attempt to kill them, but they are able to escape with Samonosuke covering Michelle and Henri's exit. As they escape, a nearby boulder shatters, revealing a slumbering Gertrude, now waking up, who then charges at Henri, but Michelle acts as a shield and takes the hit for him, knocking her unconscious. Before Gertrude can charge Henri again, Samonosuke arrives and begins fighting it, successfully killing it for good. Henri mourns, assuming Michelle to be dead, but she manages to wake up with only minor injuries. As they embrace, Arco decides to head back to Jacques, and Henri tells her to ask Jacques to marry Michelle, finally accepting her as his new mother. After Arco leaves, the three get in Michelle's car and successfully escape the exploding castle, heading towards the Eiffel Tower. Arco finds Jacques, now recovered from his near-death experience, and relieved that he's okay, tells him that Henri and Michelle are now on good terms and relays Henri's message, amusing and relieving Jacques. Jacques continues to the castle and finds Vega Donna in the now-completed Flying Fortress just as it is about to lift off, latching onto it with his whip. As it becomes airborne, Vega activates a cannon that destroys Mont Saint-Michel entirely, angering Jacques as he almost falls from the Flying Fortress. As it continues to fly, the mechanical legs begin to retract, including the one Jacques is now hanging from. 
Assuming this to be a long journey, Jacques takes the time to rest, but when the fortress reaches Lake Biwa, the legs begin to extend again, causing a groggy Jacques to fall from the fortress. After the fortress lands, now taking the appearance of Azuchi Castle, Akko leads Semenosuke and Heihachi to Jacques, who managed to survive thanks to the snow seemingly breaking his fall. Eventually, Jacques wakes up and after learning where he is, is stopped from attacking Heihachi by Samonosuke. Heihachi apologises for their conflict, explaining that he had no choice but to side with the Genma due to Tokugawa's allegiance, finally stopping after it became too much and asking to join the Oni instead. Jacques accepts and Heihachi thanks him. Akko notices that Lake Biwa is far too cold for the season and Samonosuke agrees that the Genma are involved, telling of the Oni army orb that is said to slumber nearby suggesting that it could enable them to attack Azuchi Castle. Heihachi offers to find it, but Jacques tells him to return to the castle instead in order to have an ally on the inside. Heihachi is disappointed, but agrees and heads towards Azuchi Castle. After traversing the frozen lake, the two Oni reach the Oni Mansion, but as Jacques enters, a gate shuts, locking him inside. Samanosuke leaves to find another entrance, and Jacques navigates the mansion's puzzles and traps until he finds the basement. Inside, he finds the Oni Army Orb, which awakens, sensing his identity as an Oni warrior. Samanosuke arrives soon after, confirming that it's the orb they need, and the two leave for Azuchi Castle. In the plains outside the castle, a horde of zombie warriors charge towards the two, but Samonosuke places the orb into his gauntlet, causing the slumbering army of Oni to awaken and fly forth, charging towards the Genma. Samonosuke stays put to maintain control of the army while Jacques joins the fight, pushing his way through the Genma and reaching Azuchi Castle. He finds Heihachi inside just after dealing with stray Genma, and after learning why Samonosuke isn't with them, is met by Ranmaru, now aware of his defection from Nobunaga. Heihachi confirms his intent to kill the warlord, and Ranmaru leaves mocking Heihachi, claiming him to be incapable. Heihachi gives chase after directing Jacques to find Nobunaga at the top of the castle. Fighting through more Genma, including a once again resurrected Marcellus, Jacques reaches the throne room to find Vega Donna, who is angry that he has come this far. Introducing herself as the queen of the Genma, she attacks Jacques after he refused to bow to her. Despite her speed and agility, Jacques manages to defeat her. She dies, wishing that she did so in Nobunaga's arms, and a hidden staircase is revealed. Jacques climbs it to find a mortally wounded Heihachi who was caught in Ranmaru's trap, and after Samonosuke arrives, he uses his last breath to tell them that Nobunaga is actually in Honnoji Temple, telling them to destroy the Genma. Heihachi succumbs to his wounds, and after a moment of silence, Jacques has Akko return to the future to tell the others what is happening. The two then head towards Hanoji Temple to meet with Mitsuhide. In the future, the group arrive at the Eiffel Tower and Akko appears, explaining the situation in the past. While this excites Henri that Jacques could come home, Samonosuke is worried that if Jacques fails, Nobunaga will arrive in this time, asserting that the time folder needs to be destroyed regardless of the outcome. Michelle and Henri stay behind while Samonosuke climbs the tower. Initially using the elevator, he is forced to climb out after it breaks down. Due to the activated time folder, time distortions begin appearing as he climbs, some of which catching Genma inside as they attempt to stop Samonosuke. Halfway up, he finds the folder, this one far larger than the one found in Mont Saint Michel, and is forced to fight off another brainstorm before damaging one of the folder's power sources in order to clear the way forward. Samonosuke climbs to the top of the tower and confronts Ranmaru, refusing to allow him to bring Nobunaga to the future. Ranmaru draws his swords, threatening to use Samonosuke's head as a welcoming gift for the Warlord. Now in complete control of the Genma blood in his body, Ranmaru is significantly faster and stronger, but Samonosuke once again proves too much for him. Heavily injured, Ranmaru crawls to the control lever and activates the time folder before Samonosuke can stop him. Ranmaru celebrates for a moment before collapsing, and Samonosuke is unable to disable the machine, telling Akko to join Jacques and stop Nobunaga's arrival into the future. Jacques and past Samonosuke arrive at Hanoji to meet with Mitsuhide, 
and the attack begins, this time with both Jacques and Samonosuke joining the assault. At the entrance of the temple, Ranmaru appears to block the way and Jacques decides to fight Ranmaru alone to avenge Heihachi. Ranmaru is knocked back by Jacques whip and is soon disarmed, leading to Jacques viciously beating Ranmaru before sending him from the temple balcony to the ground below, killing him. Before entering, Jacques once again finds the gatekeeper and after an arduous battle finds the legendary ultimate whip. He and Samanosuke enter the temple and confront Nobunaga, the warlord recognising that yet another Oni is here to stop him. After a brief moment, he attacks the two with magic, knocking Jacques back as Samanosuke rushes in to attack. Nobunaga uses his unnatural speed to catch the Oni off guard and incapacitates him, turning towards Jacques as he gets to his feet. The two begin a difficult battle, but despite Nobunaga's power, Jacques manages to defeat him after a long struggle. He rushes to Samonosuke, who has regained consciousness, and Jacques begins to glow, the folds of time now beginning to reassert themselves by returning everything to their respective times. Samonosuke thanks Jacques for his help, and Jacques bids him goodbye, with the time distortion opening and slowly warping him back home. However, Nobunaga, still not dead, gets up and lands a surprise attack on Samonosuke, who quickly tells Arko to go to the future Samonosuke. While Jacques is trapped inside the timefold, Nobunaga takes the opportunity to stab the injured Oni, killing Samonosuke as Jacques is warped home. Now back in the future, Jacques takes a moment to collect himself, but overhears Henri calling him. The two enjoy a happy reunion with Michelle joining them in a family embrace. He then addresses the future Samonosuke, who's been briefed by Arko on what happened, and Jacques tries to go back with him to finish off Nobunaga, but Samonosuke tells him that the folds of time wouldn't allow that. Samonosuke bids Henri and Michelle goodbye, and finally returns to his own time. With him and Arko gone, the three start to head home, but the Genma Ranmaru, still alive from his fight with Samonosuke, sneaks up behind them and lands a fatal slash on Henri. Enraged, Jacques brutally retaliates against Ranmaru, savagely striking him with his whip until Ranmaru is left dead. Rushing back to his son, Henri unfortunately dies in his arms. As the two mourn his death, Jacques' gauntlet begins to transfer all of its Oni magic to Henri, causing Jacques to lose all of his Oni power including his weapons and the gauntlet itself. As a result, Henri is successfully revived the three tearfully celebrating. Realising what just happened, Jacques expresses his eternal gratitude to the Oni for saving Henri's life. In Honoji, Samonosuke reappears ready to face Nobunaga. Before he does, he encounters the gatekeeper who takes him once again to the Dark Realm, and Samonosuke retrieves the Bisherman Sword once again. He enters the temple to confront Nobunaga and notices the corpse of his past self. He absorbs the dead Oni's magic from his gauntlet, and this gives him enough Oni power to transform him into a true Oni Musha, finally doing battle with Nobunaga. This power proves too much for Nobunaga to even damage, and after initially being overpowered, he transforms into a strengthened Genma form, giving him enough power to combat the Oni Musha. Despite this, after a brutal struggle, including disarming Nobunaga and stealing his Genma Samonji, Samonosuke finally brings the tyrant down. Now both back in their human forms, Nobunaga, now too weak to keep fighting, finally accepts defeat, and Samonosuke uses his gauntlet and the anti-darkness charm to seal Nobunaga away forever. He and Akko escape the temple before it is reduced to ash, and Samonosuke is assumed by all to have perished in Honoji's fires. Some time after, near a riverbank, Arko finds Samonosuke and tells him that she plans on staying with him forever. Samonosuke says she's free to do as she pleases, which angers her and she flies off in a huff, but she soon decides to make herself human-sized, surprising Samonosuke and telling him that she can fall in love too. Samonosuke jokes that she just needs a boyfriend now which annoys her further, but she quickly assumes that he always knew what she meant, clearly now infatuated with him. The two finally begin to leave, now on a mission to seal the Oni Gauntlet in order to prevent Nobunaga from ever rising again. 
With the world assuming Samanosuke and Akko to be dead, they decided to change their names to conceal their identities, with Akko now being named Arin, and Samanosuke taking the name Tenkai Nankobo, now wielding staves instead of swords to further deceive those around him. At some point, the two returned to Enryaku Temple on Mount Hie, and with the Genma finally gone, created an only barrier to keep them away should they reappear. There, Arin is tasked with the guarding of the Oni Gate that led to a prison on the brink of Hell, filled with Oni that have been corrupted by Genma. Tenkai had also placed his Oni Gauntlet inside Enryaku Temple, sealed away hoping that it would no longer be needed. The death of Nobunaga caused the rest of the Genma to vanish, now with no one left to act as Genma Lord in Nobunaga's stead. However, now returned from his western campaign, Hideyoshi Hashiba learns of Nobunaga's death, deciding that it's time for him to begin uniting the world under his own rule. Thirteen days later, in Yamazaki province, Hideyoshi met Mitsuhide in battle and successfully killed him, avenging Nobunaga and claiming his former lord's authority for himself. It's believed that Samanosuke soon constructed the Akechi tomb to bury his uncle and was able to fill the area with Oni power so that Genma could not disturb it. Not long after her brother's death, Oichi remarried to the general Katsui Shibata, who proved to be a loving father figure to her three daughters according to Ohatsu. However, the next year, due to his staunch opposition to Hideyoshi, the two met in the Battle of Shizugatake, and Katsui was killed by Hashiba. Learning of this news and that this would mean that she would be forced to become Hideyoshi's concubine, Oichi committed suicide, leaving her daughters to be placed in the care of Hideyoshi. In 1584, Ieyasu, already disliking his son Ogimaru, agreed to have Hideyoshi adopt him, renaming him Hideyasu Hashiba. Deeply scarred by her mother's death, Ohatsu spent her days in Osaka Castle inconsolably mourning until she was found by Hideyasu. After showing her around the castle and playing together every day, Ohatsu was able to slowly open up and move on from her mother's death. As a result, the two developed a strong bond. In 1585, Hideyoshi gained the clan name of Toyotomi by the Imperial Court, making him the head of the clan. Over the next seven years, he would successfully unite Japan under his rule. When the Toyotomi clan rose to power, Hideyoshi took notice of a member of the Ishida clan, Mitsunari Ishida, for his skills in finance, soon appointing him as a bureaucratic leader in his government. He is noted to have been especially cruel and malicious to the children residing in the castle. At some point in the Yagyu village, the now retired Jubei Yagyu, now known as Sekishusai, was training his youngest son, Muninori and Sekishusai accidentally struck Muninori's eye, causing him to lose it. In order to save his life, Muninori's mother replaced his now missing eye with her own, unfortunately costing her her own life. His mother's death caused Muninori to grow resentful and eventually hateful towards the Yagyu, believing that Sekishusai mercilessly ripped out his eye and killed his wife to replace it. Munanori's new eye turned out to be his mother's demon eye, a genetic oddity that appeared very rarely in Yagyu and enhances the user's speed and strength when utilised. This oddity likely only existed in Yagyu's due to their only blood. In 1587, Hideyasu was sent to take part in the Kyushu campaign, earning honours after leading the assault on Buzen Iwashi Castle and for his key role in Hyuga Province. However, at some point during the campaign, Hideyasu was part of an invading force under Hideyoshi's command that attacked and burnt down a village that housed a boy named Roberto, who had moved there with his mother after living in Espana for a short time after his father passed away shortly after his birth. Due to his Spanish father and Japanese mother, Roberto was very noticeably mixed race, resulting in anti-Semitic harassment from Japanese individuals, but during the attack on his village, Roberto's mother was killed and he was orphaned. He was, however, found by a Portuguese Christian missionary named Luis Frois, who immediately took Roberto in 
and cared for him like his own son. Louis Freus became known for similar forms of kindness, taking in and caring for a total of 27 children. At around the same year, Chacha, the eldest daughter of Oichi, would approve of a suitor for Ohatsu, who turned out to be Kiyogoku Takatsugu, and the two would soon become engaged, though Ohatsu found herself wishing to be with Hideyasu instead. In 1588, Chacha would eventually become Hideyoshi's concubine, likely due to her close resemblance to her late mother. Believing that there was no point in fighting anymore, Chacha did not oppose the decision, and Hideyoshi was known to treat her well. A year later, she gave birth to Hideyoshi's son, Hideyori Toyotomi, which delighted the warlord, who gave her Yodo Castle as a gift, and Chacha soon became known as Lady Yodo after living there for a long time, though it's noted that she disliked her new name. Not long after taking in Roberto, Hideyoshi ordered the construction of what came to be known as the Toyokuni Research Facility in Sakai, with another being constructed in Shimabara. These facilities were used to perform research on the Genma under Mitsunari's and Luis Freus's command. While working in the Shimabara facility, Luis used it to house the 27 orphans that he had taken in, and they all soon viewed the structure as their home. At some point after meeting Ohatsu, Hideyasu was adopted by Harutomo Yuki, and he was made the head of the Yuki clan. However, not wanting to lose the freedom to live his life how he chooses, he snuck his twin brother, named in-game as Sada'ai, into the castle in order to rule in his stead. Sada'ai was happy with this arrangement, and Hideyasu, now known as Hideyasu Yuki, felt that Sada'ai was a far better ruler. This ruse worked due to their similar appearance. Soon after Hideyori was born, Mitsunari began to become enamoured with the Genma for their power after further research, eventually breaking the seal that had entrapped the Genma Triumvirate since the Oni Genma War. Mitsunari soon made a pact with Claudius, the leader of the Triumvirate, allowing the Genma to take control of his body in exchange for power. Total control was not taken, however, and Mitsunari was allowed to remain in control of his own free will and mind. Claudius then makes contact with Hideyoshi and strikes a deal with him. He asks him to help them revive Fortinbras as the true Genma God of Light, and he would be reborn as a god once the light descends. Hideyoshi accepted, and was implanted with the seed for Fortinbras's rebirth. Hideyoshi slowly began to change, and Hideyasu was sent to Korea in 1592 to take part in the Western Invasion, launching from Nagoya Castle in Hizen. Witnessing the madness of the war where soldiers began to take ears from victims as trophies when heads proved to be too difficult to carry home, over time simply taking them from innocent bystanders and even children since there was no way of telling the difference, Hideyasu returned to Japan and refused to pick up his sword again for the next few years. Soon after Mitsunari and Luis were tasked with researching the Genma, Hideyoshi came into contact with Espana, who were also at war with England at the time. Hideyoshi proposed an alliance after discovering that they were also conducting Genma research of their own, in the hopes of using them to turn the tide against England, and the two countries began carrying Genma research back and forth between countries. Around the time that the deal between Claudius and Mitsunari was struck, Rosencrantz managed to possess Luis Freus, and alongside Claudius, continued to use the Toyokuni research facilities for Genma research, and eventually used them to house Genma artifacts known as the Dark Stones, which gathers and sends dark energy to Hideyoshi in order to fuel the Genma seed. Rosencrantz soon forced Luis to perform fatal experiments on all of his adopted children. Luis, however, managed to regain enough control to implant exercising prayer beads into Roberto's arms, giving him the ability to kill Genma without a weapon. As a result, Roberto grew up to be a fighter with ridiculous physical strength. After waking up outside with a key to the facilities, he vows to kill Luis Freus, believing that he betrayed him. 
With a dark stone also placed in the Shimabara facility, a transport device was constructed in Nagoya Castle to allow quick travel between the facility and Kyoto. At an unknown time after reaching adulthood, Munanori Yagyu cut ties with his clan and slaughtered multiple members of his family before fleeing the village, choosing to serve Hideyoshi and the Genma. With Munanori's betrayal leaving the Yagyu clan with no one to take the name of Jubei after his massacre, Sekishusai began training his grandchildren to find a suitable heir to the Jubei name. After leaving the Yagyu village, Munanori begins wearing an eye patch over his demon eye, only removing it when absolutely necessary, and grew to hate sword fighting due to it reminding him of his father. Upon reaching adulthood, Ohatsu begins receiving training in firearms from Magoichi. While in the same manner as Jubei Yagyu, the Magoichi name is given to every leader of the Saigashu gun troop, it is confirmed to be the same Magoichi that fought against Nobunaga alongside Seki Shusai. This finally leads us to the events of Onimusha Dawn of Dreams. In 1596, the Genma Triumvirate were able to cause the appearance of the Omen Star in the sky, signalling Hideyoshi to begin the preparations for the resurrection of Fortinbras. He ordered the execution of foreigners and holy men, including everyone on board the San Felipe, a western ship that Hideyoshi's forces successfully captured. Soon, Fushimi Castle was hit by a massive earthquake, and further natural disasters rocked the country. In the midst of all the chaos, the Genma reappeared en masse, slaughtering anyone they find. To make matters worse, these Genma are no longer affected by human weaponry, meaning only those with magical abilities or enhancements are capable of fighting them anymore. Realising that Hideyoshi has begun working with the Genma, Hideyasu left the castle and decided to pick his sword up once again in opposition of the Genma. Hideyoshi had begun to have Genma cherry trees planted that when grown would release Genma insects. These insects, once ingested by people, would turn their hosts into mindless slaves of the Genma, while also increasing their strength and bloodlust. These trees were discovered to have been made using human bodies, becoming known for the screaming that emanates from them. Ophelia, the Triumvirate's priestess, convinces Hideyoshi to sacrifice Yodo in order to transform her into the Genma Mother Tree, which slowly begins to grow under Fushimi Castle. She is also contacted by Mitsunari, now in league with the Triumvirate, to aid in the enslavement of his vassal, Sakon Shima, who while loyal to Mitsunari, expresses concern at his willingness to use the Genma. Refusing to ingest Genma insects, Mitsunari decides to allow Ophelia to place her mask on Sakon, and he is forced into complete unquestionable slavery to the Triumvirate. With Yodo dead, Ophelia takes Yodo's form in order to keep up appearances for everyone else and maintain watch over Hideyoshi. In Sakai, Tenkai, after learning of Mitsunari's alliance with the Genma, confronts him, beginning a fight on Sakai's rooftops. After a brief skirmish, the dark stone within the Sakai facility begins to activate, with Tenkai recognising the consequences, but Mitsunari is able to get the better of him, warning him that he cannot win unless the infamous Black Oni appears before dropping him from the rooftops. With the dark stones activated, the Genma trees slowly begin to bloom and Genma insects begin to spawn from them. Tenkai is forced to retreat and the next day, the Darkstone emits a massive wave of energy that not only destroys much of the city, but spawns a massive horde of Genma. Before they are able to attack a young girl, Hideyasu appears and fights back, completely overwhelming the horde despite fighting alone due to his unnatural power as the reincarnated God of Darkness, something he is still unaware of. He soon notices the Toyotomi crest on the armour of a massive Genma samurai and draws his purification sword, further tapping into his black power. With both swords, he manages to completely overpower the giant and slay it. With the child safe, he continues towards the Genma Horde, slaying all who face him, and eventually becoming a black Onimusha to destroy another Genma giant. During the battle, 
Fort and Brass, now able to manifest himself in spirit form due to the Omen Star's appearance, watches Hideyasu's fight, intrigued at his power. After this battle, Hideyasu begins journeying across Japan, and after discovering the nature of the Genma trees, begins to burn them wherever he can find them, unfortunately killing the screaming humans that they are created from. Over time, people across Japan recognise Hideyasu by his Oni-like strength and his reputation for burning Hideyoshi's trees everywhere he goes, leading him to be given the nickname Soki, which roughly translates to Oni of the Ash. He also gains the nickname Blue Demon due to his signature blue armour. Approximately two years later, Sekishu Sayagyu finally picks a worthy successor to the Jubei name, which turns out to be his granddaughter, Akane Yagyu. Her prodigal skill of the Yagyu Seigo style, also known as the Stance Without Form, mixed with her impressive agility, causes her to be the strongest of her generation, and at the young age of 14, was granted the name Jubei. Akane was also one of the rare Yagyus born with the Demon Eye, further increasing her agility and strength. With this name, she was given the task to hunt down and assassinate her uncle Munanori to avenge the fallen Yagyu. At some point, Munanori, now a loyal servant of Hideyoshi, forces a now adult Ohatsu under the threat of death into ingesting Genma insects in order to force her into staying loyal to him and the Toyotomi clan. Ashamed at what she had become, she began to wear baggy clothing to hide what the insects had done to her body. At the same time, Roberto, still hunting for Luis Frois, was eventually captured and locked inside the dungeons of Sawayama Castle by his possessed father. Deciding to wait for the right moment, he does not escape his cell despite being easily capable. In the plains of Suruga, Hideyasu, embracing the name Soki, awaited in the local town for a Genma convoy led by Naoyuki Ban Danyamon that carried a large number of Genma trees, making plans with Minokichi, a young member of the Mino clan and son of Minogoro, the original Mino clan member that aided Samanosuke. The two executed a plan to trap the convoy so that Soki could burn it before it escaped. Once the caravan arrived, Soki gave Minokichi his lamentation and stepped in front of the convoy, initially speaking to Danyamon with great respect, but quickly shifts his demeanour to be more casual, warning him to leave the trees and be spared death. Danyamon, surprised that Soki knows of him, vows to kill Soki and orders the Genma to take the trees ahead, but following their plan, Minokichi, who dreams of being a warrior one day, happily swings by with Soki's sword to cut the ropes holding a large wooden structure, blocking the convoy's path before quickly returning the sword to Soki. Soki quickly notices the smell and realises that Danyamon has been eating Genma insects to increase his strength, leaving him no choice but to kill him. Danyamon requests his opponent's name, but Soki refuses to answer. The two begin their battle, but despite the boost in strength he received from the insects, Soki proved far too much for the warrior, cutting him and his forces down entirely with little effort. With Danyamon dead, Soki and Minokichi begin to burn the convoy's trees, pained that there is no other way to slow the spread of Genma insect. Overlooking the two, Munanori and Ohatsu witness Soki's impressive victory over Danyamon, and while Munanori doesn't really seem to care too much to stop him, Ohatsu recognises Soki as Hideyasu, and Munanori decides not to kill Soki yet and leaves, ordering Ohatsu to follow. She hesitates, but eventually does so. A week later, the newly named Jubei, hearing of the Blue Demon, arrives in the plains of Suruga in search of him, believing his nickname to be literal. She is accosted by two drunks, but after scaring them with her swordplay, they fearfully point her in Soki's direction before fleeing. At the same time, Minokichi warns Soki that a wicked force is approaching in large numbers, but since there's no trees, Soki decides not to take action until Minokichi tells him that a child is nearby and may be caught up in the attack. Minokichi leads Soki in the child's direction and finds Jubei in the middle of crawling through a broken barricade. Angered at him for startling her and unaware of the Mino clan, she draws her weapon on him, but is intercepted by Soki. 
she recognises him as the Blue Demon and attacks him, not listening to Soki's attempt at defusing the situation while also recognising her Yagyu Sego style, and the two fight. While clearly highly skilled, which Soki recognises, he still proves too much for her and asks her name, shocking him when he learns that she is the famous Jubei Yagyu. She demands his name too, and after a moment of hesitation, he says that he doesn't have one anymore, telling her that everyone simply calls him Soki. He notices her demon eye, but before she can explain, Minokichi warns them that time is up and hordes of Genma begin appearing from purple meteors that begin flying through the town from the centre. Jubei tells Soki to stay back due to their immunity to human weaponry, but Soki immediately kills one, shocking Jubei who initially believed that only the Yagyu sword held by a member of the Yagyu or Oni clan could harm them. As she begins to realise that Soki may actually be an Oni, she falls off a bridge avoiding another Genma meteor with Soki soon following. The two make their way through the town until they reach a temple that houses a large Genma that was sealed long ago by a nameless priest. Learning of the two keys to unseal it, Soki and Jubei unlock the seal, freeing the Genma so that they can slay it. Realising that they are on the same side, Soki and Jubei decide to ally with each other. Back at Soki's hideout, Jubei tells him and Minokichi that Genma trees are rumoured to have been appearing in a fortress in Sata Pass, and that she was heading there anyway because she's looking for someone. Soki assumes this to be an assassination, but drops the topic when she hesitates to answer. After resting up, the two head under the cover of night to infiltrate the fortress. Noticing that patrols have increased, Soki begins a frontal assault to draw attention while Jubei finds a more subtle way inside. Jubei manages to infiltrate the fortress, and while Soki is holding off the Genma patrols, she cuts the hinges holding the main gate up, crushing the Genma and letting Soki inside, now calling him Blue. The two climb the scaffolding around the fortress, and upon reaching the roof, Jubei lets Soki run ahead, leading him to be met by Munenori, who now commands loyalty from crows. He attacks Soki, and after a brief skirmish, Soki recognises Munenori as a Yagyu due to his reverse fencing style. Munenori is impressed by his knowledge, but mocks him by calling him Ieyasu's illegitimate son before sheathing his blades, claiming to not like fighting. He is then suddenly attacked by Jubei, who identifies him as her uncle Munenori Yagyu, and Munenori is surprised to see her be picked as his assassin. Jubei orders Soki to go ahead to burn the trees, snapping at him not to interfere despite his protests. He reluctantly leaves, and Munenori walks away, not caring to fight her. After further mocking, Munenori suddenly gets angry noticing Jubei's demon eye, reminding him of his own, and decides to fight. Soki enters the warehouse, but before he can burn the trees, he is given a warning shot by a musket, who is revealed to be Ohatsu. She begs him to return to Osaka, but Soki refuses, causing her to ask why he's been trying to burn the trees down. Soki cuts the covering from the trees, revealing their grotesque form, and telling her that Hideyoshi isn't the man he once knew. Ohatsu tries to reason that he is Soki's father, and Soki says that's why he needs to stop him. Soki remains defiant despite Ohatsu claiming that the Toyotomi clan control everything and that he has no chance alone, accepting that he'd rather die trying than submit. Ohatsu begins to weep, admitting that she just wants to be with him, but is forced to shoot him, angering Soki by calling him his real name. In the end, the fight between them is one-sided and Soki disarms her, reminding her of the people's suffering calling even the wars less destructive. Before he can convince her to join him, Munenori appears, mockingly disallowing Soki from stealing away Ohatsu. Soki demands to know where Jubei is, and Munenori claims that she's been disciplined and has little time left, also warning that he is not an enemy that Soki wants to make. Knowing that he has little time, Soki is forced to abandon his plans to burn the trees and rush to Jubei's rescue. Munenori laughing as he flees. In reality, after defeating her, Munenori has Jubei tied up on the scaffolding with lit dynamite under her feet. As she hopes that Soki at least burnt the trees, Soki manages to arrive and cut the fuse before the dynamite can detonate, saving Jubei's life. 
Jubei scolds him for saving her instead of finishing the mission and begins to weep at Munanori's cruelty. Soki tells her that they're going to Kyoto so she can kill Munanori there while he kills Hideyoshi. At the hideout, the party decide to attack Hideyoshi directly, interrupting the Daigo Blossoming Festival that Hideyoshi is attempting to organise in order to have every cherry tree blossom at the same time and release Genma insects en masse, enough to enslave everyone in the country and fuel the Genma Mother Tree with enough dark essence from the surrounding Genma trees to pull the Omen Star toward the world until it's close enough for Fortinbras to be reborn. Tenkai, now knowing of Soki's power, decides to wait for the two in Sawayama, believing that they would inevitably pass through on their way to Kyoto, killing Genma to pass the time. Before they leave the hideout, Soki is visited by Fortinbras, who expresses interest but leaves without introducing himself. It turns out that Soki is the only one who could see or hear him, confusing everyone else. The two eventually arrive at Sawayama and are soon ambushed by Genma. By this point, the castle is filled with magic essence and the two are forced to navigate magic barriers before they can continue. When they unlock the large central door and enter, they suddenly find themselves separated due to the surrounding illusion created by Tenkai, who at first silently confronts Jubei, attempting to confirm her identity. At the same time, Soki finds himself alone and is also met by the monk, who shows an illusion of a dead Jubei, angering him. Tenkai becomes certain that he is the Black Oni, and after a brief fight, Soki disarms Tenkai and prepares to kill him, but his own Oni blood disallows him from taking the monk's life. He realises that Jubei's body was an illusion, and the two are interrupted by a large Genma before Tenkai can introduce himself. Soki and Tenkai are forced to team up against it, and Jubei reunites with them after the Genma is defeated. Tenkai recognises her as Sekishusai's granddaughter and knows of her demon eye, then identifies Soki as the Black Oni, introducing himself and revealing that he has been travelling Japan searching for Oni warriors in order to defeat the Genma. Tenkai joins the two and tells them that they need to rescue the Westerner Roberto from Sawayama Castle. Tenkai plans to use the hole left behind by the large Genma they fought to infiltrate the dungeons before it's sealed up. However, assuming that Mitsunari has caught on to their progress, he asks Jubei to act as a decoy to draw attention away from himself and Soki as they infiltrate the dungeons. Jubei is initially unwilling, but Tenkai acknowledges her speed and agility, perking her up and she becomes much more willing, Soki joking that Tenkai is good with kids. Jubei makes her way to the infested city and begins attacking Genma, drawing attention and allowing Tenkai and Soki to enter the Sawayama dungeons unhindered. Fighting through the Genma guards and multiple puzzles, they reach Roberto's cell and while Soki tells him that they're here to rescue him, Roberto, in Spanish, says that they've wasted their time and breaks his own chains effortlessly. Soki asks him where he's going, and with Tenkai translating, Roberto tells him not to get in his way of killing Luis Frois. Soki offers to work together, but Roberto attacks him, angry at his persistence. Soki realises that he's squaring for a fight and attempts to offer him a weapon, but Roberto shows that he doesn't need one. Tenkai reminds Soki not to kill him, and after a brief fight with Soki coming out on top, the dungeon begins to rumble. Roberto decides to leave and pursue Luis, while Tenkai and an annoyed Soki stay behind to deal with the Genma as they appear. Soon, the source of the rumbling appears as Sakonshima, now wearing Ophelia's mask, and clears the Genma away himself so that he may fight the two Oni without them. He proves to be a powerful enemy, but Soki and Tenkai's combined efforts are enough to overwhelm him, forcing him to flee in pain only for the door to close behind him, locking the two inside. A rope is soon lowered from a well above them by Ohatsu, who beckons Soki to climb up. Meanwhile, Claudius, currently controlling Mitsunari's body, is visited by Rosencrantz, who is still having trouble getting used to being called Luis Frois. He confirms that the preparations for the Diago Festival are complete and that they only need the trees now, pleasing Claudius. Claudius assures that he has gathered the necessary number of trees and expects Soki to escape the dungeon's trap very soon. He asks if Rosencrantz has heard from Ophelia, who simply says that she is keeping watch over Hideyoshi. As Soki climbs out of the trap, 
Ohatsu asks what Hideyoshi wants with the trees, why they look like people and why they are called Genma trees. Soki explains what they are, and that they produce Genma insects that turn people into abominations, something that causes further shame for Ohatsu. After explaining Hideyoshi's plan to turn the entire country into mindless drones, Ohatsu finally accepts Soki's mission and joins him, suggesting that the death of Mitsunari, who is in the castle itself, may cause Hideyoshi to return to his senses. Soki agrees, and Ohatsu asks about Tenkai, but Soki says he'll be fine, and they begin making their way through the castle. After climbing to the upper levels, they are confronted by Munanori, who congratulates Ohatsu for leading Soki to him. Ohatsu denies luring him into a trap, and when beckoned, initially hesitates to return to Munanori's side, but is forced to comply after being reminded that he holds her life in his hands. As she leaves, Munanori angers Soki, telling him to stay away from her and the two fight, Munanori repeating his warning that he is a dangerous enemy. Despite his skill in the reverse fencing style, Soki defeats him, asserting that he is a dangerous enemy as well. Before Munanori can remove his eye patch, Soki demands to know why Ohatsu is trapped with him, only for Munanori to mockingly tell him that her body is wonderful before escaping with a smoke bomb. Soki reaches the balcony and confronts Claudius, still assuming him to be Mitsunari, who when asked if he is controlling Hideyoshi, declines, saying that Hideyoshi is capable of making his own decisions. Angry that Hideyoshi is willing to commit such acts, Roberto suddenly bursts in, still looking to kill Luis. Before anyone can act, a trap door drops Soki and Roberto to the lower floor, and Claudius and Rosencrantz leave to complete the preparations for the festival. Rosencrantz is disappointed to leave Roberto behind, still wanting to experiment on him, but Claudius assures that they will catch up to them. As the two shout for the Genma to return, a Genma resembling Hakuba awakens in the room, and while unable to move, is still able to spawn lesser Genma and slash at the two warriors. Regardless, they are able to defeat it, and Soki brings Roberto back to the hideout. With the party now back, Tenkai, fluent in Spanish, speaks to Roberto, explaining their goals and asking for Roberto's help, revealing his knowledge of the exercising beads in Roberto's arms. After a moment, Roberto agrees, on the condition that he doesn't take orders, and that his primary goal is still the death of Luis Frois. Tenkai tells the others that Roberto has agreed and the two attempt to introduce themselves, but Roberto is unresponsive, only able to get a simple sigh when Soki returns his book to him. The party agree to head straight for Kyoto in order to stop the Diago Blossom Festival, and while Soki, Jubei and Roberto are all focused on their own missions of revenge, Tenkai is forced to remind the party of their ultimate aim of burning down the Genma Mother Tree in order to destroy the other trees. He tells them that they must converge on the Akechi tomb just outside of Kyoto first, the resting place of Mitsuhide Akechi, which is filled with Oni magic, enough that Genma are unwilling or unable to approach, making it a good staging point. The group reach the Akechi tomb, and after noticing the large number of Genma, the group agree to split up and regroup at the entrance to Daigo Temple. While at the tomb, however, the voice of Mitsuhide Akechi speaks to Minokichi, granting him a magic power to use as a last resort should it be necessary. The group are able to reach the temple, and after reconvening, they enter only to be greeted by Claudius, Rosencrantz, and Munenori, all clearly expecting their arrival. Jubei and Roberto rush forward towards their chosen target despite Tenkai's protests, and Soki soon rushes off too after Claudius tells him that Hideyoshi is waiting for him. Before Tenkai can stop him, Claudius summons Sakon to face him. With the party now separated, Soki rushes to the top of the temple and finds Hideyoshi, initially bowing before him in a final hope of convincing him to stop. Meanwhile, Tenkai is still stuck fighting Sakon, but after a struggle, he is able to come out the victor, once again rendering Sakon into incredible pain as he attempts to fight off the control of Ophelia's mask. Claudia steps in and fights Tenkai, disappointed in Sakon. Still kneeling, Hideyoshi, clearly happy to see Soki again, asks Soki to stand with him to help his son Hideyori rule the world, and Soki begs him to stop the mainland invasion. 
Hideyoshi refuses, claiming that the lives of the people are meaningless compared to him. So he drops the facade and angrily calls out Hideyoshi's evil and the suffering of innocence at his hand, impressing Hideyoshi with his deception, and after drawing the purification sword, begins to channel his black power, promising to cut his father down. In response, Hideyoshi has his surrounding loyalists transform into Genma generals, challenging Soki to show his black power, and Soki's power erupts, transforming him into the Black Onimusha. Effortlessly cutting down the generals, Hideyoshi is forced to face Soki himself, and while his power was enough to put up a fight, Soki comes out the victor. Unfortunately, Hideyoshi rises again, seemingly unharmed, revealing that he was only toying with the Oni, and sends Soki flying, calling himself a god, and offering to spare Soki if he pledges himself to Hideyoshi's service. Soki refuses, asserting that he decides his own path, angering Hideyoshi, who demands that all lives are decided and controlled by him. Soki remains steadfast, and Hideyoshi concludes that Soki has chosen to die, preparing his overwhelming power to kill him. Ohatsu, moved by Soki's resolve, rushes to his side, and Hideyoshi decides that she will die with him. Before the blast can hit them, Tenkai, now finally away from Claudius, manages to shield them. He quickly tells Soki to go to Mount Hiei, where he can unlock his true power as the Onimusha, calling him humanity's last hope. Hideyoshi's attack swallows Tenkai entirely, and Soki and Ohatsu flee, heeding Tenkai's words. At around the same time, Jubei, assuming the rest of the party to be dead, begins to hide in Kyoto and waits for her chance to kill Munanori. This wait lasted for days, depriving her of food and sleep, which leads to Munanori easily besting and capturing her. Roberto, also separated from the group, ends up getting captured by Rosencrantz, who begins to experiment on him. Soki and Ohatsu arrive at Mount Hiei, but as they explore the area, Ohatsu collapses, her body now being ravaged by the Genma insects due to her now open opposition to Hideyoshi. Minokichi tells Soki that he needs to kill her before she becomes a Genma tree, but while Soki is unwilling to do so, they are approached by Arin, who takes Ohatsu to Enryaku Temple and tells Soki to follow her in order to save Ohatsu. Soki agrees and finds Arin, who tells him to transform into the Onimusha by entering the Oni Gate and retrieving the Oni Orb from the mansion on the brink of hell before the gate closes. Soki enters and after traversing the maze-like mansion, he is challenged by Garganto. After a brutal battle, Soki defeats him and finds the orb, but he is soon met by Marcellus who assaults him, stopping him from leaving before the gate closes. Arin, saddened at Soki's failure, concedes that Ohatsu is now beyond saving, but Soki, his true power unlocked after retrieving the orb, proves so strong that he breaks the gate open from the inside, a feat that Arin deemed impossible. With this new power, Soki is able to defeat the now corrupted Ohatsu and use his purification sword to cleanse her of the Genma insects, saving her life and permanently freeing her from their influence. Afterwards, Soki is soon visited again by the spirit of Fortinbras, who recognises Soki's awakening as the Onimusha, comparing it to the God of Darkness, but disappears without explaining more. The party agrees to use Enryaku Temple as their new hideout, and with Ohatsu clothes shredded during her fight with Soki, she uses what she's able to find nearby to make a new, less cumbersome outfit, which catches Soki's attention. Not long after they settle in, Arin finds an aerogram addressed to Soki, one of 500 sent to ensure that the message reaches him, annoying Arin. Soki reads it to find that it's from Munanori, who is keeping Jubei captive in the remains of Azushi Castle, threatening to kill her if Soki doesn't arrive. Jubei believes that Soki won't come for her, but Munanori disagrees. Soki and Ohatsu leave for Azuchi Castle, and after navigating the various puzzles in Genma, they manage to reach Munanori and Jubei on the roof. Jubei snaps at Soki for coming, but Soki calls her precious before getting interrupted by Munanori. Before his crow can attack Soki, Ohatsu shoots it dead, now revealing that she isn't Munanori's pet anymore. Munanori calls a new crow, and begrudgingly begins fighting the pair. 
The two overwhelm and exhaust him, but he rips off his eye patch, allowing him to utilize his demon eye, restoring his energy and increasing his speed and strength. Despite this, he is still defeated, and after Jubei demands that Soki not kill him so that she is able to in the future, Munanori flees, promising to destroy the Yagyu and kill Sekishusai. Returning back to the hideout, Jubei is given a proper meal and a full night of rest, and the next day, Jubei is back to full health, and introductions are made with Arin and Ohatsu. Soon after, Minokichi tells Soki and Ohatsu of a western hospital in Osaka called the San Espana, and that rumours say that a westerner with tattoos on his arms was taken there. Soki assumes this to be Roberto, and that he'll be okay in a hospital, but Ohatsu quickly points out the Spanish name, causing Soki to link it to Luis Frois, since he was the only westerner not slaughtered by Hideyoshi. While the three converse, Arin and Jubei begin talking, with Arin teasing Jubei for her jealousy of Soki and Ohatsu, comparing it to her feelings for Tenkai. Jubei admits that she sees Soki like an older brother and isn't sure if she loves him or just has a small crush. Soki quickly tells her that they're off to find Roberto, and Arin takes another moment to tease her. Inside the San Espana, Rosencrantz is still experimenting on Roberto, attempting to find the source of power in his arms. The party arrive and quickly fight their way to Rosencrantz's lab and battle him. His trickery and magic prove to be insufficient and he is beaten, but when Genma spawned due to a trap previously set by Rosencrantz, his weakened state allowed Luis Frois to briefly take control and beg Soki to take Roberto while he held Rosencrantz back. With Luis struggling for control over his body, the party flee with Roberto back to Mount Hiei. For 10 days, Roberto fails to wake up, with Aaron commenting that the fact that he's still alive at all is a wonder. Ohatsu decides to watch over him until he finally wakes up, gathering the party at his side. Realising that they saved his life, he finally begins speaking to them in Japanese, and after apologising for keeping it from them, agrees to fight with them. After a total of two months, Roberto returns to full strength, surprising the party, though laments at the amount of time lost for his recovery. He soon decides to go back to Sawayama Castle, telling the party that there's something he left there. He initially tries to go back on his own, but the party refuse, and he eventually accepts their help. The group reach Sawayama and enter the castle through a hidden entrance, once shown to Roberto by Luis due to his need to get in and out quickly before his possession. Navigating through the castle, they reach the dungeons and eventually find Roberto's lost keepsake. With his item found, they exit the dungeons through the large hole that Soki and Tenkai once entered through during their last visit, but are interrupted by the same large Genma that created it. The party successfully defeat it and return to Mount Hiei. After a brief rest, the party begin to debate on how they can defeat Hideyoshi, with Aaron saying that even Soki's awakened Onimusha power is not yet enough and Roberto suggests heading to Sakai and enter the Toyokuni research facility, revealing that the keepsake they just found was a key to get inside. With his key in hand, the party arrive at the Sakai facility and successfully infiltrate it. They find a control room and Roberto, familiar with the machinery there, is able to access the system and through pieces of text that he could pick up, learns of the Genma's plans to revive the Genma God of Light. Before telling them, he instead tells them that they have to destroy the Dark Stone being housed in this facility, which is currently acting as Hideyoshi's power source, and after finding a note, work their way through the building, destroying the generators in order to force the backup elevator to switch on, taking them to the underground chambers. They find the Dark Stone, and after it resists blows from Ohatsu and Jubei, Claudius appears, asking them how they found their way here, before quickly realising that Roberto told them. Roberto reveals that only he is able to destroy the Dark Zones during to the exercising beads implanted into his arms by Luis, and begins repeatedly punching it. Claudius compliments Luis's ingenuity, realising that this is why Rosencrantz is unable to control him. He attempts to kill Roberto, but Soki blocks the attack and the rest of the party fight him. Claudius, by his own admission, remains at a disadvantage due to still using Mitsunari's body and is defeated, and to his surprise, Soki finally recognises him as Claudius, demanding to know what his plan is. 
At the same time, Roberto successfully destroys the Dark Stone, but is left exhausted as a result. Claudius reveals his intent to revive Fortinbras, confirming that everything, including the foreign war, was the Genma's doing, and leaves challenging Soki to try and stop him. After the party returns to Mount Hiei, Roberto explains the Triumvirate's plan, including the fact that the Genma are simply using Hideyoshi as a vessel for Fortinbras, rather than allowing him to become a god himself. While Roberto is aware that Claudius is within Mitsunari's body, assuming that by now Claudius has taken complete control, contrary to his original agreement with his host, and that Rosencrantz is in full possession of Louise Freuss, now knowing that said possession is why Louise Freuss suddenly changed and killed the other 26 orphans, he is still unaware of who Ophelia is posing as, though correctly assumes her to be somewhere close to Hideyoshi. Soki is initially relieved that the Darkstone is already destroyed, making that one problem already solved, but Roberto reminds him that the second stone is housed in a facility in Shimabara. The group takes some time to rest and after another discussion, Roberto mentions to them that while those aboard were all killed, the western ship, the San Felipe, is still seaworthy and currently in port at Sakai. The group agree to go and bid goodbye to Arin, and soon after they leave, the only gate begins to rumble, catching Arin's attention. This turns out to be Tenkai escaping from the Oni mansion inside the gate, thanks to his Oni gauntlet refusing to let him die. After a brief reunion with Arin, he rearms himself with his old gauntlet and follows the party to Sakai. The group eventually reach the port and find the San Felipe, but begin to sense something approaching, which turns out to be Sakon. Soki holds off Sakon while the rest of them get the ship ready, and as Sakon is beaten, the ship begins leaving port, the group shouting for him to hurry on before he's left behind. Thankfully, Soki manages to jump far enough to be caught by Ohatsu and Roberto, who pull him up, and they begin to escape, only for Sakon to also reach the ship. He attempts to destroy it, but Tenkai manages to arrive and knock him off balance for a moment, telling everyone that Hell spat him back out. He and Soki fight off Sakon one last time, landing a blow that knocks Sakon overboard and breaks Ophelia's mask. Claudius and Rosencrantz watch them leave from the port, realising that they know of the Darkstone in Shimabara, though Claudius remains calm. Rosencrantz confirms that Ophelia has already prepared for them at Hizen, then asks about Sakon, and Claudius decides that he has failed too many times to be rescued, disappointing Rosencrantz before the two disappear. The journey is long, and the party makes a few stops along the way to make repairs and fight off occasional Genma, but it's otherwise a smooth journey thanks to Soki's experience with ships, due to when he was shipped off to the foreign war. On the ship, Soki is visited once again by the spirit of Fortinbras, who calls them polar opposites, but before we can elaborate further, Tenkai breaks contact between them, himself barely able to see him and warning Soki that his presence doesn't feel right, not knowing that it's Fortinbras. Soon, the party lands in Beppu Bay in Kyushu, but walks ashore to find an abandoned village that is filled with dark essence. They pass through and climb the hill to pass over and head towards the Shimabara facility, but are met with Ophelia, still disguised as Yodo in order to manipulate Ohatsu. The rest of the party ready themselves to fight, but Ophelia's manipulation causes Ohatsu to stop them, not willing to risk if this is truly her sister or a doppelganger. Ophelia takes the chance to spawn more Genma, and the party have no choice but to fight them off, with Soki slashing at Ophelia after they are cleared out. Ohatsu, heavily disturbed, collapses for a moment, but Ophelia decides to shed her disguise and reveals her true form, launching a full attack on the party. Her speed and agility are not enough, and the party overcome her attack, with Ohatsu angrily shooting her as she lay on the ground, finishing her off. She collapses once again, assuming her sister to be dead, but Soki assures her that Yodo is likely still alive, and they continue towards the facility. Setting up camp nearby, the party prepare themselves for an assault on the Shimabara facility, and not long before they leave, Ohatsu has a heart-to-heart -heart with Roberto after finding him reminiscing about his friends when he was a child living in the facility. He says he now feels confused about killing Luis, and Ohatsu says that makes him human. Roberto takes the opportunity to tease her about her clear bond with Soki, and even allows himself a laugh when she struggles to deny it. 
Afterwards, the party make their final preparations and head to the facility. As before, they explore the structure and destroy the main generators in order to activate the backup elevator and manage to reach the basement, only to find the Darkstone gone. They are soon approached by Rosencrantz, angering Roberto, but as he rants about their plans being almost complete, Claudius appears and shows them that the stone is actually floating above them, far beyond reach. Rosencrantz backs away as the platform begins to rise and Claudius fights the party again, only to be defeated by the time they reach the top. However, coming into close proximity makes Claudius near invincible and Roberto rushes past him to try and destroy the Dark Stone, only to be incapacitated by the Genma's magic, followed by the rest of the party before they can act. As Claudius readies himself to kill them, he is suddenly attacked by Sakon, who manages to reach them and without the mask, demands that Claudius relinquish Mitsunari's body. Claudius does so, though it is uncertain whether Mitsunari is left dead or simply unconscious by this due to Sakon's attack, and Claudius appears in his true form, now able to fully manifest it due to the Omen Star's close proximity to the Earth. Sakon falls back with Mitsunari at Tenkai's word, and the party face Claudius, while Roberto is left to destroy the Dark Stone. He eventually succeeds and the party is able to defeat Claudius as a result, but Claudius falls, gloating that even with the destruction of the Dark Stones, only seven days are left before the star arrives, far too little time to reach Kyoto and kill Hideyoshi. Claudius's death also causes the death of Rosencrantz and Luis, who in one final moment of clarity praises Roberto's efforts, dying with a smile. The group escape the facility and begin to question how they'll reach Kyoto in time when Sakon approaches, telling them of the transport device in Nagoya Castle that will take them there instantly. With the castle only being four days travel away, the group make their way there, setting up camp nearby once they arrive. While there, Minokichi gives Soki a gift in the form of his late father's sled, which would allow travel up to long distances, far longer than Minokichi is capable in his young age. Soki initially refuses, but Minokichi says that there's no guarantee that he may survive the attack on Nagoya Castle, so Soki compromises by promising to return it once the fighting is over. The party make their final preparations and launch their attack. Waiting inside, however, are Munanori and Ophelia, who escaped her death in Hizen. While the castle is heavily guarded, they are able to get inside and fight their way to the top, confronting Munanori. Jubei prepares to fight, but begins to tell her uncle about his eye. Munanori is initially unreceptive, but Jubei reveals that his eye was lost in a training accident, and that his mother's eye that replaced it was given willingly, knowing that it would kill her as a result. The weight of this truth causes him to break down for a moment, only to drop the facade, revealing that he doesn't care after all this time. Soki is angered, but Jubei holds him back, choosing to fight Munanori herself. Even with his demon eye, Jubei finally succeeds in defeating her uncle, but Munanori begins to maniacally laugh at his own pain, causing Soki to realise that he has consumed Genma insects. Munanori flees upstairs and the party chase him to find Ophelia protecting him inside the transportation device, activated and mocking the group's failure to stop the star's descent with only one day left. After teleporting away, they destroy the receiving device so that it can't be used again, and as they realise just how close the star is, Minokichi reminds the group of the Akechi tomb, revealing the power he received from Mitsuhide, and knowing that this power would likely be fatal for him, he uses it to transport the party to the Akechi tomb without him. Drained by the use of this power, Minokichi's thread snaps, and he closes his eyes, hoping that he has finally become a warrior great enough to make his father proud. The party arrive at the Akechi tomb and take some time to mourn Minokichi's death, with Jubei almost running back in order to find him. Not wanting to waste his efforts, the party resolve themselves to finish what they started, and prepare for the final battle. At this point, the Genma mother tree has grown so large that it has lifted Fushimi Castle into the sky, as if to be reaching for the Omen Star. The group attack Kyoto once again and are soon confronted by Rosencrantz, who has been revived by the essence of the now approaching Omen Star, attacking them in his true form. Roberto, however, manages to knock him away with a brutal uppercut and stays behind to finish him off. 
He bids them farewell, particularly Ohatsu, who he has now fallen in love with, and rushes at Rosencrantz. They are soon intercepted by a revived Claudius as well, who Tenkai stays to fight this time. Further up, Jubei splits from the group as well, knowing that Munenori is nearby, and asks Ohatsu to take care of Soki, regretful that she came between them. After the two leave, she confronts her uncle, now filled with Genma power after eating more Genma insects. He suggests that the Oni and Genma are not very different after being asked why he betrayed the Oni, and Jubei readies herself, beginning their battle. Soki and Ohatsu are quickly intercepted by Ophelia, who Ohatsu is able to hold off so that Soki is able to keep going. Reminding him that he got this far because of the entire group, she tells him that they are destined for each other, and Soki reluctantly leaves her to fight Ophelia. Soki begins climbing the Mother Tree's route towards Fushimi Castle, and as he does, the others are able to one by one defeat their opponents. Soki reaches the top and finds Hideyoshi sitting in front of the Mother Tree, who tells him that destroying the Dark Stones had little effect due to the Genma Seed of Fortinbras implanted into his chest, still supplying him with near unlimited power. He then uses a mechanical suit of armour and begins to fight Soki. Despite his still overwhelming power and enhanced armour, Soki is able to finally overcome Hideyoshi, destroying his armour and defeating the tyrant. As he lay beaten, a heavily injured Ophelia approaches and angrily chastises Hideyoshi for not even being able to buy them enough time, revealing that he was just another of their pawns. Hideyoshi curses his decision to sacrifice Yodo, and Ophelia rips the seed from him, claiming that it's all they need to complete Fort and Brass's revival. She uses it to awaken the Mother Tree, but with Yodo inside it retaining a small form of consciousness, one of the new roots impales Ophelia, angry that she betrayed Hideyoshi. Realising that she's still alive within the tree, Hideyoshi apologises for sacrificing her, and Yodo pulls him inside, still wanting them to be together. Still seeing Soki as an enemy, she picks him up by the leg, but Jubei arrives to cut the root, freeing him, with Tenkai, Ohatsu and Roberto arriving soon after. The party readies themselves to burn the tree, and the fight begins. After a long battle, they are able to weaken the mother tree enough to allow Soki to purify it with his second sword, destroying the tree and freeing both Yodo and Hideyoshi. Yodo manages to wake up and Hideyoshi, too weak from his battle with Soki, thanks him for stopping him, claiming that he never understood his country or people and recognising that he allowed the Genma to turn him into a monster. Soki, moved by Hideyoshi's final realisation, finally calls him father, and Hideyoshi makes one final request, asking Soki to watch after Hideyori. With this, Hideyoshi finally breathes his last. However, the group hear a noise from outside, which turns out to be the star's arrival to the Earth, and in the confusion, Munenori picks up the Genma Seed without being noticed, soon appearing on the roof of Fushimi Castle, Jubei baffled that he's still alive. With the star finally here, Munenori uses the seed to be reborn as the God of Light, transforming into the infamous serpent-like Genma at its full power. Knowing that they are completely outmatched, Tenkai gives Soki the gauntlet, telling him that Nobunaga is still sealed within. After Soki puts it on, Tenkai has the rest of the party give him their strength, hoping that their power combined with Nobunaga's would be enough to match the newly reborn Fortinbras. As the power pours into the gauntlet, Soki undergoes a huge transformation, finally becoming the fully reincarnated Oni God of Darkness. With this new power, the two gods begin a massive clash, and after a long struggle, the God of Darkness prevails, defeating the Serpent God, leaving it to crash back down into the castle and dissipate. Soki, now back in his human form, takes in their victory, with the party revelling in the Genma's defeat. But after a short time, they notice that something isn't right, and soon hear the footsteps of the true God of Light, as Fortinbras in his human form begins to descend from the Omen Star, now fully reborn thanks to the usage of the Genma Seed. Munenori, somehow still alive, angrily rushes at Fortinbras, but is frozen in the air by the God's power, and after striking him, drops him from the castle to the earth. Realising that this is the true Fortinbras, they attempt to fight, 
but are effortlessly incapacitated by his godly power, once again recognising that this is far beyond their abilities. Fortinbras mocks their weakness, but claims that he will spare them if they kneel before him and call his name. Defiant, Soki agrees, but calls him evil, and a worthless sack of shit, refusing to bow. Fortinbras retaliates, amused by Soki's pride, and asks him why he bothers fighting without a gauntlet or sword, noting that he can't even stand. But Soki gets up, referring to the rest of the group as his powerful weapons. Unamused by this, Fortinbras unleashes his full power by absorbing all of the dark essence from the surrounding trees, and the final battle begins. The struggle is long and brutal, but after finding a way to make Fortinbras vulnerable by reflecting his own power back at him, they are finally able to weaken him enough for Soki to impale him with his purification sword, slowly killing him. Fortinbras labels this sword to be Soki's powerful weapon, but the Oni calls humanity's greatest weapon Faith. Fortinbras calls that nonsense, and in his final breath, calls Soki a fool to the end, attempting to corrupt Soki in one last ditch effort. With that, Fortinbras is finally destroyed forever. The eruption of power that resulted from Soki's impalement of Fortinbras leaves the rest of the party unconscious, but Jubei soon wakes up, taking in their final victory. Soki, however, claims that there is still something left to be done, and with his godly power fully unlocked, perhaps due to Fortinbras's last ditch attack, begins to walk up towards the Omen Star, now intent on destroying it entirely as Jubei desperately attempts to wake Ohatsu to stop him, knowing that Soki will likely not survive. Soki erects a magic barrier to stop her from interfering, and as she begs him not to leave her, Soki asks her to remember him when she sees the real cherry blossoms. Finally reaching the star, Soki uses his full godly power to destroy the Omen Star, unfortunately dying in the process. The rest of the group awaken soon after to find Soki gone and the Omen Star destroyed, and are soon forced to escape Kyoto with Yodo as the roots of the Genma Mother Tree begin to crumble. In the aftermath, Ohatsu was utterly inconsolable for some time, but eventually learned to finally let go of the past and went through with her marriage with her fiancé, Kiyogoku Takatsugu, and keeping watch with Yodo over Hideyori, who had become the Toyotomi heir. After Ohatsu had married, Roberto set sail back to Espana, feeling responsible for his country's hand in the rise of the Genma, and readying himself to face even the king of Espana himself if necessary. Tenkai finally resumes his mission to seal the gauntlet now that it was no longer needed, this time accompanied by Arin who refused to let him go without her. In moments alone, they would refer to each other by their real names. Jubei, despite wanting to, did not return to the Yagyu village, hearing of rumours that someone, likely Munenori, was still alive, so she continued her own journey in search of him. The next year, during the next blossoming festival, Jubei visits Hideyasu's grave, and promises to protect the trees that he helped save. She says goodbye to him, and with a still living Minokichi, and now wearing an eye patch over her demon eye in a similar fashion to Munenori, the two continue their journey. And that's it! The entire timeline of Onimusha. Honestly, this took even longer to write up than I thought. Seriously, the script alone took weeks to finish, plus another week or so to actually record voiceover for. Before I sign off, there is one or two last things I'd like to bring up which is a potential mistake in Soki's past involving his name and battle history. According to a conversation with Roberto, he claims that the attack in Kyushu, when Roberto's village is burnt down, is the first battle he was a part of after receiving the name Hideyasu Yuki. However, unless events were swapped around, this isn't possible, since the Kyushu campaign occurred in 1587, while he was not adopted into the Yuki household and received the name Yuki until 1590, making his first battle as Hideyasu Yuki either the 1590 Siege of Odawara or the Japanese invasion of Korea which began in 1592. This is why I've essentially ignored this conversation. Finally, there is the obvious major plot hole concerning Ohatsu. Since the Genma were immune to human weaponry now, 
the main characters needed a reason to be able to kill them. Sulky, Jubei and Tenkai were all Oni warriors, and Roberto had the exercising beads. So Ohatsu was given the excuse that because Nobunaga was her uncle, she had Genma blood, making her able to kill them. Obviously, since her parents, Oichi and Nagamasa, were not Genma, this is obviously impossible. Which is why I didn't bring it up. Honestly, since she didn't kill Genma, at least on screen, until after she was infected by the Genma insects, I'm willing to say that she does have Genma blood, but only because of the insect's effect on her body, with her ability to kill Genma remaining after Soki purified her. And with that, we are finished. I'm honestly surprised that no one has done a full timeline of this series before, even taking into consideration of its cult status. I'm hoping that I've covered everything here. The amount of times I had to go back and rewrite sections because I remembered or found a small detail is ridiculous. But I feel like I've covered more or less the lot. Unfortunately, while I don't know their overall impact on the story, I wasn't able to reference the mangas Twilight of Desire or Night of Genesis since I couldn't get my hands on any copies and I found no information of the story online, meaning I couldn't cover events surrounding Hidetsugu Toyotomi or Okuni. All I know is that Tenkai and Arin clashed with Hidetsugu at some point, and that after travelling with Tenkai, Akane and Okuni found themselves fighting Genma together for a time, since Okuni was an Oni warrior in some fashion. I guess that makes this not as complete a timeline as it should be, but this is as much as I was able to find. If anyone has a better idea of what those mangas entail, I'd be happy to get a more revised version of this done. Regardless, thanks for watching what was possibly my largest project that I've ever done. Take care of yourselves. Danish, out.